Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started. We began in half Michigan time. For old timers in the room, you know what I'm talking about. So I, I'm Nestor Lopez Duran. I'm the chair of the department. And I want to just welcome everyone to this uh, amazing event to celebrate Henry Wellman's academic life. I'm just going to spend just a couple of minutes to just share a couple of words about um, my experiences with Henry, uh, and then we'll get going with the, the um, uh, real event and presentations. So I'm going to mention something that is going to make Henry and myself feel very old, <laughs> is that I met Henry 22 years ago when I arrived at Michigan as a graduate student. And I was trying to remember what was my first memory of Henry. And I realized that my first memory of Henry was sitting in his office where he was explaining to me how to write an introduction. <laughs> and he was explaining to me that the concept of the funnel, how you begin with big topics and then get narrower and narrower. And to this day, I talk to my students about the concept of the funnel, and that came from Henry. But what it was noticeable to me about that memory is that I have no idea what I was doing in Henry's office. <laughs> I, after all, I'm not Henry's student. I was not even in developmental. Um, but for some reason, like many of us, I gravitated to Henry to get mentorship from him. So I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure that throughout the day, you're going to hear a lot about uh, all the many dissertations that Henry uh, shared and all the many amazing things that his students are doing. But I want to also remind everybody that for every dissertation he shared, there's probably about five or 10 of us that consider Henry a mentor, whether he knows it or not. <laughs> now, I want to also share one more story that the last few days trying to Diving deep into Henry's work was very, very humbling. And there was one single metric that was the most humbling of all. I discovered that Henry's work has been cited 54,000 times. Now, let me put that into context. One is 54,000 times means that there are 54,000 studies that reference Henry's work. Now, there's another thing that to me was pretty astonishing is that one of his papers, the um, seminal work on, on the measurement of theory of mind, that single one single publication from 2020 has been cited more times than all of my publications combined. <laughs> uh, and that's not because I'm a slacker, I promise you. <laughs> now, when I was doing that, it occurred to me, I don't even know what is my most cited publication. So I went to Google Scholar and began trying to find what was my most cited publication. And I found out that it was a paper on the developmental foundations of externalizing behaviors in youth. Guess who was the senior author in that paper? <laughs> Henry Wellman. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to start everybody by just first thanking Henry for an amazing career, for being a mentor to many, many, many of us, and for especially being an amazing human. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nestor, for those wonderful comments. I have to admit, I, I also uh, looked up um, my publications after seeing how many Henry had. And three of my top publications were co-authored with Henry. So um, I urge all of you who have ever published with Henry, I think you can thank him for your, for your citations. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm Susan Gelman. I'm a professor in psychology. And as the organizer of the event, um, I wanted to welcome you as well all for being here. Um, and a special warm welcome to Henry's family um, and also to all the symposium speakers. 
and I also wanted to thank the psychology staff. Um, they helped put this event together. I could not have done it without them. Um, and I wanted to mention some of the people who worked most on this, Jamie Howe, Jen Barnett, Cassie Caverhill, and especially Keith Wiley, who was an absolute wizard in managing all the many details of the event. So if we could give them a round of applause. Um, so I have to tell you, I really agonized over what to say at this event uh, because it's impossible to do justice to Henry in just one talk. He's a giant in the field of psychology. He's a wise, devoted, and generous mentor. And he's been my closest colleague and collaborator for almost 40 years. I wanted to highlight Henry's massive scholarly contributions, his remarkable brilliance, his creativity, his integrity, um, and also my personal thanks and debt that I owe to him. And then I thought it wouldn't hurt also to give a few anecdotes along the way. <laughs> so I actually prepared three different talks. And I'll, I'll, I'll warn you, I I'm not going to give any of them. But um, <laughs> since I went to all that trouble, I will tell you a bit about them. Uh, the first talk was going to be about Henry as a mentor. And I was going to call it Seven Things I Learned from Henry. Um, now, you have to realize, back in 1984, I arrived at the University of Michigan as a new assistant professor. I had just finished my PhD uh, literally weeks earlier. Um, and technically, Henry, this you know, really important figure in the field, and I were colleagues. Uh, but in actuality, I consider him my postdoc mentor. He taught me how to teach a graduate seminar. He taught me how to write a grant proposal. He taught me how to frame a theory paper. And he showed me, through example, how to mentor students. Um, so I never, I've never stopped asking Henry for advice. Uh, and he's never stopped helping me out. He's given me career advice, constructive feedback on grant proposals and on papers. But I feel like the lessons that I've gleaned over the years are more than that. They're more like life lessons. The second talk was going to be about collaborating with Henry and the really profound influence that it's had on my own thinking. I was going to call this talk children's understanding of the non-obvious, as this was actually the title of the very first piece that Henry and I wrote together back in the 1980s. Henry had been asked to write a chapter for an edited volume, and he asked me to join in. Um, his idea was that our research programs really dovetailed nicely because Henry was working on children's understanding of the non-obvious by looking at children's understanding of mental states like belief and desire, which of course are invisible, uh, can't be seen, uh, have to be inferred. And I was working on children's understanding of the non-obvious by looking at children's categories and how children think about essences and, and insides, which also can't be seen and also have to be inferred. And I remember that Henry really pushed us to think about the larger message here. What did these findings tell us about developmental theory? Um, and this was really, you know, this was hard for me. And um, I learned so much from those conversations. Um, and Henry actually provided a two-part answer. He said, first, Non-obvious concepts, our data were showing that non-obvious concepts are really foundational to human thought, not just for scientists, but even for small children. And second, this ability is not the result of intellectual development. It actually drives intellectual de development. It's a mechanism for intellectual development. This was completely counter to what was received wisdom at the time. And you know, that really kind of framed my research going forward, and these are still themes in my own research. The third talk was about how Henry's theoretical contributions influenced my own ongoing research. 
I was going to call this one, it's theories all the way down, lessons for teaching children about COVID-19. Now here I should say, I think, you know, Henry has made numerous contributions, you know, most famous for his work on children's theory of mind, but he also um, argued in a, a very important and um, novel way that children form common sense theories about the world that undergo change and reorganization with development. Uh, much of this work, um, uh, this uh, initial framing was done with Alison Gopnik, who will be uh, talking later today. Um, and he formulated what it means to have a theory, how a common sense theory is similar to a scientific theory, but different from it and why you would ever believe that children could form a theory. Um, and this work inspired uh, a project that we're doing right now in my lab where we're looking at children's theories about COVID-19 and how this might inform how best to teach them about disease transmission. Um, and it turns out that viruses are a really interesting problem space for children here because they're not quite sure what theory to fit them into? What, what is a virus? Are they, is it alive or not alive? Uh, does it operate strictly by mechanical forces like movement through space? Or do they possibly have intentions uh, like wanting to get people sick? Um, so these are the sorts of questions that we're studying. But after giving this a lot of thought, um, I finally decided that the best way to express what's special about Henry is to take a developmental approach, of course. <laughs> uh, because if we review Henry's developmental path, we can see the essential Henry, what remains constant over change. So this talk is entitled The Essential Henry, A Developmental Portrait. <laughs> Isn't this great? <laughs> um, we can start with a classic philosophical puzzle. What is constant over a lifetime? In what way can we say that this young boy is the same as the man that he became? The features are different. Many cells have been replaced. Is Henry just a series of changing identities? Or is there some fundamental reality that's his true and deeper self? Is there something that we might call his essence? Maybe it's the warm smile. Maybe it's the knowing look in his eyes. Maybe it's the ears. <laughs> Or are there deeper features as well? Well, let's begin at the beginning. Henry was born in Hickory, North Carolina. Hickory's motto is life well crafted, which is surprisingly apt. Um, shortly after this picture was taken, Henry moved with his family to South America, uh, to Chile to be more precise, and he lived there until he was about two. Uh, his first words were in both Spanish and English, so at least for a short while, Henry was bilingual. And this established a theme in his life and his work, which was a serious interest in different cultures. And I'm gonna come back to this theme later. Here, Henry shows an early curiosity about extraordinary minds. <laughs> <laughs> he may be wondering, how Santa can possibly know that all those children are naughty or nice? Um, he would go on to publish on this topic some years <laughs> later <laughs> in work with John Lane and Margaret Evans. Here is Henry in his first grade classroom in Fort Meade, Maryland, dressed up as a magician for Halloween. Uh, and here he shows an early fascination with children's understanding of pretense which he went on to study with Jackie Woolley. Either that or possibly this is his first attempt at devising a false belief test. <laughs> Henry's father was a career Marine officer, so the family moved often. At one point, Henry had, had attended more schools than his grade level, and by 12th grade, he had uh, been to uh, 11 different schools. So here he is climbing a palm tree when his dad was stationed in Hawaii. And when he was there, he also learned to play the ukulele. So we see that already he was a person of hidden talents. He was adventuresome and he liked to try new things. 
as a teenager, Henry earned the rank of Eagle Scout. And uh, many of you may know this already, but in case you don't, this is a very big deal. Only 4% of Scouts reach this level. It's the highest achievement that a Boy Scout can reach. Uh, but looking back, it's actually no surprise that Henry did this because the Eagle Scout traits are classic Henry traits. Trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind. Uh, sorry, I accidentally skipped over high school. Okay. <laughs> Henry graduated from high school in a small town in California called 29 Palms, which was located in the Mojave Desert. Henry was the first National Merit Scholar from his high school, and they didn't have another one for over 20 years. So we see youthful signs of Henry as an intellectual and a trailblazer. He went on to Pomona College and graduated magna cum laude with a BA in psychology. And when he was there, he met Karen Lind during their sophomore year. She was an art history major at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania and was spending the year at Pomona on a Swarthmore Pomona exchange program. After graduation, Henry was a kindergarten teacher. Un uh, now, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of Henry at this time, uh, but since he was a kindergarten teacher, I want to have a picture of kids. And this is actually from the cover of the book that Henry wrote with his student, Karen Barch. It's a really beautifully insightful look at developmental changes and how children think about the mind. Um, they used longitudinal analyses of natural language conversation um, and discovered uh, some really important changes um, from, um, to a belief theory of mind from a desire theory of mind. And Henry really has what I call a green thumb for how to talk to children and how to listen to children. Um, and of course, one of the reasons he taught kindergarten was because of his interests in developmental psychology. But also, teaching did count as a deferment during the Vietnam War. Um, now, fortunately, Henry's draft lottery number was a good one, and I'm told that nobody from that time forgets their draft number. Henry's was 317 out of 365. So he was able to go to grad school without worrying about being drafted. But by the time he knew his lottery number, it was too late to apply for PhD programs that started in the fall. And the only developmental program with mid-year admissions was the University of Minnesota Institute of Child Development, the only developmental program. So he applied there and got in. It happened to be the number one program in the country. <laughs> Henry's advisor at the University of Minnesota was John Flavel, who is famous for introducing Piaget to the English-speaking world and for his own research on children's thinking. Um, and here's a picture of the two of them many years later. Um, Flavel referred to Henry as clearly his most distinguished former student and noted that working with Henry changed the direction of his own research. While at Minnesota, Henry and Karen were married. And I think this means that they'll be celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary next year. They're life partners and have raised two wonderful sons, and I'll say more on that soon. After Henry earned his PhD, he started his career at Arizona State, and then, lucky for us, two years later, he was recruited by the University of Michigan, where he's been ever since. And this picture was taken somewhere around the time of that move. <laughs> Michigan is where Henry has done most of his life's work. And here are just some of the books that Henry wrote. And the picture doesn't include his nearly 200 journal articles and book chapters. Uh, Henry's work is incredibly impactful. And um, Nestor alluded to this as well. Um, but just to give an example, Henry's meta-analysis of theory of mind development, which was written with uh, his students, David Cross and Julie Watson, was cited over 5,000 times and is the third most highly cited article of all time in the premier journal in developmental psychology, child development. 
I also wanted to point out that Henry and Karen co-authored the book in the top left-hand corner. Uh, it's called Reading Minds, and it was published uh, just two years ago. It presents the research on theory of mind to a general audience, and it's been translated into seven other languages, including Chinese, Korean, Spanish, and Portuguese. Um, I looked on Amazon, has five-star uh, ratings, um, and I really liked what one of the reviewers wrote. Uh, quote, it's a bit as if Charles Darwin had written a book on evolution for the general reader. I first met Henry on November 19, 1981. I know this because I went back and checked. I wrote about this meeting in my diary. <laughs> I described it as, quote, an exciting day. <laughs> this is all completely true. Um, I was a grad student at Stanford on the colloquium committee, and Henry was our speaker. And it was my job to pick him up from the airport. And I wrote in my diary how impressed I was that Henry combined experimental and naturalistic methods in his research, that he was knowledgeable about the Chinese language, and that, to quote, he's so deeply concerned with epistemological issues. I guess I was a nerd. Um, <laughs> I could also tell that he was a kind person because it wasn't until many years later that he commented on the absolute wreck of a car that I drove to ferry him to and from the airport. <laughs> the 1980s were an incredibly important period for Henry as this is when he and Karen became parents. Here's Henry with their firstborn son, Ned. Maybe Ned, do you wanna? Yeah, there he is. <laughs> Sure, you can recognize him from the picture. <laughs> uh, this is a beautiful family portrait. Here's Henry with Ned and Daniel. There's Daniel. <laughs> Here's the family a few years later. Here, Ned and Daniel are displaying Wellman pride. So if you look closely, you can see they're both wearing t-shirts that say Wellman uh, union on it. These are t-shirts from Wellman, Texas. There's a, both a Wellman, Texas and a Wellman, Iowa, and Henry's visited them both. <laughs> and here's the whole family, Henry and Karen, Ned and his wife, Chelsea, their kids, Chase, Alexandra, and Emma, and Daniel and his wife, Taryn. I'll turn now from Henry's family to what we might call his academic family. Here's Henry with the other developmental area faculty. I think this would have been in the 90s. Uh, Henry was the mainstay of the area as well as the Department of Psychology and the Center for Human Growth and Development. Um, a pattern got established early in his career uh, where he kept getting drafted into positions of leadership. And I'm going to illustrate this with a few facts. Uh, Henry served as area chair three times he was on the department's executive committee every decade since the 1980s. He was a member of the Center for Human Growth and Development Executive Board for almost 30 years, and he served as associate director of the center twice. He also helped establish the University of Michigan Children's Centers uh, with Steve Sternberg, who's here today, uh, and served continuously on the executive board for nearly three decades, including as a chair for 10 years. Oh, and he also served as president of the Cognitive Development Society, but I think you get the idea. Uh, here's some more recent photo of the developmental faculty and Henry's up there on the left. Um, I'll show a couple of older snapshots from informal developmental area gatherings uh, where Henry is characteristically deep in conversation. <laughs> this is from 1989, this is from 1999. Here, Henry's enjoying a conversation with Harold Stevenson. Harold was a faculty member at Michigan, a very important person in Henry's life. Uh, and when Henry was honored with the name chair from Michigan, he named it after Harold. And I, I you know, won't have time to sort of go into um, the connections, all the connections between Henry and Harold, but I did want to mention that Harold uh, did very important cross-cultural work on children's academic learning in China, Japan, and the US. 
And here are Henry and Karen with, with Harold later in his life. Here Henry is with Professor Jing, who was invited to uh, Michigan by Harold in 1979. He's the very first Chinese psychologist to visit the US after the opening of China, after the Cultural Revolution. Uh, and when Jing was a visitor at Michigan, Henry's office was down the hall, and they became friends for life. Um, there's a really fascinating oral history that Henry uh, conducted with Professor Jing for the Society for Research and Child Development, where Jing talked about his role in opening up China, Chinese psychology uh, to the outside world and introducing international psychology into China. And Henry has been to China uh, numerous times as well. Um, and here Henry is with Twyla Tardif and Professor Li Chi Ju from the Chinese Academy of Sciences, who's uh, visiting in 2003. Um, Henry published several papers on Chinese children's theory of mind and language in collaboration with Twyla and Professor Ju and others. Henry traveled around the world to present his research and collaborations with other scholars. And this is from a Theory of Mind conference at St. Andrews in 1989. Um, and that's Paul Harris in, at the back, the one sort of in the middle at the back, who we'll be hearing from later today. Um, and Henry's uh, in the back row, more on the left. Um, and others in the picture include many of the top names in theory of mind research at the time. Andy Whiten, Joseph Perner, Tom Schultz, George Butterworth, Alan Leslie, Janet Assington, Sue Leakum, and others as well. This talk wouldn't be complete without showing Henry with some of his students. And this is from a gathering of our combined lab group at Margaret Evans's house, uh, probably around 2008. And as you can see, Henry's surrounded by students, postdocs, many of whose careers he helped launch. Um, and it's very fitting that this year, Henry received the top mentoring award in psychology from the Association for Psychological Science. With Henry's... <laughs> With Henry's help, the next generation is in excellent hands. So to recap, what is Henry's essence? Um, this is probably not a complete list, but I think it would include brilliance, intellectual depth, clarity of thought, devotion to family, scientific integrity and rigor, ability to connect with children, peerless mentoring, a deep interest in other minds and other cultures, integrity, life well crafted. So our next speaker is Kristen Lagatita. Thank you. James will help you get oh, I thought coordinate oh, you yeah. to get your talk in. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, does this microphone, is it working? You can hear good? Okay. Um, so I'm Kristen Lagatuda. I'm a professor and chair of psychology at UC Davis. And I just wanted to start by just saying thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I, I was um, just really, really honored by this opportunity. And I was told by Susan it's supposed to be a talk of research and nostalgia. And I had many versions of this talk too. So hopefully I, I'm, I'm able to, to pull this off. Um, I guess this is where I can switch the slide or, okay. So I wanted to start um, with a little of my own life history and how I got to Michigan. So this is my path to Michigan. So I went to Stanford in the late 80s and early 90s and I spent some time actually at Oxford there in a Stanford, um, Oxford overseas program. 
And it was at this time that this brand new field of research in cognitive development was just starting called Theory of Mind. Got introduced to this interesting book um, by a person in this room and just got really, really excited about this. It was really one of the first times where I was, had an opportunity to read empirical articles. I had to, it was not a fun overseas program. It was writing 10 page research papers every week, but I came back with this pile of papers um, and showed them to John Flavel, who um, was at Stanford at the time. And he was really excited about it, invited me to join his research lab. I was the first undergrad, actually, he had ever worked with um, at Stanford. And um, he was very encouraging me to do a PhD. I'm a, on my mom's side, actually, I'm the first generation female in my family ever to go to college. Never mind get a PhD. I didn't really know what getting a PhD was, but John had a lot to do with that. And he said, you need to go to Michigan and go work with Henry Wellman. So here's the actual front page of my typed, with a typewriter, application to University of Michigan back in 1993. And I mailed this off. Um, the next part was my social security number, so I took that part out because <laughs> that was the reason on the front page of all of these documents. But I'm leaving for class my senior year at Stanford, and, and it was that kind of phone, and the phone rings as I'm going out the door. And on the phone, he said, hey, this is Henry Wellman from University of Michigan inviting me to, to join the, the Michigan program. And that was an exciting day, <laughs> as Susan would say, exciting day. And then also from like my own family history, so my dad did get to go to college. He grew up in Muskegon, and he was actually a University of Michigan class of 1958. So it was kind of fun to um, sort of connect that, that part of my life together. So he's, he's still alive. He's very excited that I'm actually here coming to give a talk. So before getting off to Michigan, I did an um, honors thesis with John Flavel where I was really trying to integrate research on children's understanding of emotion and children's understanding of mind. Did an honors thesis on children's understanding of cognitive cueing and emotion, um, which you'll see continued on and really sort of developed further as I um, began to work with Henry. Um, so with that life history context in mind, let me turn to the actual focus of my talk, the research side, but I'll bring in more nostalgia here too. Um, so I've been really interested in emotions. Um, they're ubiquitous in our everyday lives, but not everyone feels the same emotion, even if they're in the same situation doing the same kinds of things. And so it makes you wonder, why are they feeling these ways? And why is there all this variability? So if you look at research on actual like effective science, like what causes emotions, um, you can know that Emotions can be caused by features of the current situation. Who's there, what's happening, good or bad things happening, things like that. But we also know that current emotions are also meaningfully connected to mental states, um, what they want, what they believe, what they think, um, the meaning that event holds for that individual. And what got me really intrigued about this whole area is that mental states are different in the sense that they're not bounded in the here and now. So let me explain what I mean by that. So outside of what a person is currently thinking or believing or intending, um, they can also be thinking about things that happened in the past, and that can change their emotions in the here and now. Moreover, what's happened in the past, your expectations, for example, that you formed in the past, can change how you feel in the present. So for example, if you had expected a much better gift than what you were given, you could feel disappointed based on your prior expectations. And we also know that emotions are caused by thinking about a person, about the future. So you could be thinking about wor being worried about an upcoming job interview or an impending retirement, things like that. You can be thinking about the future. But also the past then also connects to the future. So if we're trying to anticipate what's gonna happen next, we're also biased and shaped by what's happened to us before. So people's present emotions can be elicited by a multitude of causes going forwards and backwards in time. So in this talk, what I'll be doing is highlighting some of the research, findings from my research in sort of big picture way, um, the foundation of which, which really grew out of work with Henry during, I did graduate school and postdoctoral years here on people's beliefs about the causes of emotions. And I'm gonna be doing this, of course, from a developmental perspective, focusing on both children's and adults' emotion cognition. 
So what about first starting with emotions caused by thinking about the past? So these are studies, to test these concepts, we presented children and adults with a series of hypothetical vignettes, and we asked them to make predictions or provide explanations for children's emotions. So Henry will probably remember these good old stories, which were actually made um, with Crayola markers. <laughs> I drew them myself way back in the day. Um, actually, how I got into liking developmental psychology research is it provided it integrated my love of math with science, with writing, and art, because I could do art, too. But then I, had to, I couldn't do art for a while after that, because I had too much on my plate. But anyway, consider the following scenario. So here's Mary, and there's her pet rabbit, Floppy. And she's playing with Floppy one day outside on the grass. And this black-spotted dog runs into the yard and scares Floppy so much, Floppy runs away and never comes back. And Mary feels sad. So if you ask children why does she feel sad there, three to four-year-olds even have no problem telling you that she feels sad because the rabbit's lost or the dog chased the rabbit away. Um, they have no trouble at all pairing current situations with current emotions. So the story continues. Well, many days later, she's playing outside with her friend, and they see the black-spotted dog, and Mary starts to feel sad. So why does she start to feel sad right now? So if you ask adults this question, they'll easily explain to you, well, she feels sad because seeing the dog reminds her about her lost rabbit or she's thinking about her lost rabbit. And, and it's a very straightforward answer, but it's also really impressive because what you're doing is you're taking a current emotion, you're linking it to seeing a visual cue or reminder of the past, and you're connecting it to the person's life history. So it's actually a very sophisticated kind of response. So in studies that I did with, with Henry while I was here, um, what we found is that we tested these intuitions over several different manipulations, and we found substantial development between three and six years of age in knowing that thinking about the past can change your current emotions. Um, how do these thoughts get in your mind? Do we see increasing understanding that memories can be automatically triggered by seeing cues or reminders in the current scene. Um, knowledge that how one person feels is not gonna be the same as someone else because these connections are person specific, connected to your own life history. And then we started to tap into this thing that was really intriguing is that it seemed like kids could first get this. Their first and earliest insights were in the, were in the context of negative emotions and particularly negative emotions that didn't fit what was happening right now. So if someone was feeling sad or upset or mad when nothing was happening to them in the here and now, and that's what was allowing children to make these very, very sophisticated connections at a young age. So then we got really curious. Um, this is my most cited paper with Henry, <laughs> it, it, and it happens to be with Henry. Um, looking at, well, what's going on in their everyday lives and these everyday conversations that would enable children to develop this more sophisticated concepts about negative emotions. So in a longitudinal um, study looking at children between the ages of two and five that were tested every week, this is using the Childish Database, um, we found a lot of differences. And so one of the things we found is that when parents and children were talking about negative as opposed to positive emotions, they were much more likely to provide causes. So causal explanation talk was much more common in talk about negative emotions. More frequent talk about the past, not just bringing up past emotions, but emotions here and now connected to what's happened in the past. Use a lot larger emotion vocabulary, much more diversified emotion words to talk about emotions when you're talking about what's wrong with people versus why they're, they're feeling good. They also ask a lot more why or what happened questions. So we don't ask a lot of questions about why people are happy, which is probably why we don't know what makes us happy, but we know a lot of things that make us upset. And these patterns were showing up even at two and three years of age of really asking more open-ended questions about negative emotions. More frequent talk connecting emotions to other mental states, connecting emotions to desires or beliefs or thoughts. And a lot of talk with young kids um, when preschoolers are talking to their parents about emotions, focuses on the child's own emotions. But if they ever were to talk about someone else's emotions, it often, more often than not, was involving talk about negative emotions. Why were other people upset, for example? So 
that's a lot of science. I think this is some of my favorite papers I've ever written. Um, we're in, in collaboration with Henry, but I, I also wanted to bring up what was also happening while all of this science was happening. So I came out to, to Michigan in 1993. That's my still husband now, but we were engaged at that time, and he was going to study aerospace engineering here. We met in high school, actually. Got married in 1994, so I was here at Michigan, 93 to 2001. Had our first child in 1996. We'll be 27 this April, if you can believe that for those of you who knew her as a little one. So I graduated in 1999. I was pregnant with my second child, and Caitlin was almost three. Then John was born in 99. And then by the time I finished my postdoc here in 2001, I had a five-year-old and an almost two-year-old. So that's, you're talking about 20s in my life, lots of life events, a lot of life transitions with an incredible mentor, like helping me be successful the whole time and doing this amazing science, but also having life at the same time. And he'd leave early and go pick up his kids from school, just incredible role model for all of this. And so. This is something, um, Caitlin sometimes would come to some of the meetings up at CHGD, and I found her signature, Henry, from that time, but she was very intrigued with whiteboards. Whiteboards were kind of a new thing. <laughs> Back in the 90s, moved from chalkboards to whiteboards, and he had one. And so she asked if she could write her name on his whiteboard, and so she wrote her name. This is what her signature looked like when she was three. Um, on the bottom of this whiteboard, and he kept it there for years until, I forget what happened, but I would see him at SRC, he said, I still have Caitlin on my whiteboard there. Um, two years ago, I got a race. Yeah, so as I said, she's almost 27, so uh, it's a long time. I think it was, was it in blue? I, I remember it vaguely as being in blue, so I've tried to find a blue signature of Caitlin from that time. Okay, so more things from the old files. This is, um, Henry was chair of the department of the developmental area at the time, and he was very pleased to invite me to University of Michigan. Um, so hi again, nice talking to you. Hope to see you soon. This is <laughs> so back in when you didn't carry a phone around with a camera, you had to intentionally have a camera with you. Someone took this picture of me on film of my first SRCD in 1995 in Indianapolis. Two things of note here. It's on real poster board. This is a poster <laughs> on real poster board, which was enormous poster board, which I drove in a car because it was in Indianapolis. And I'm wearing a suit and heels, which I never, ever did again after the first <laughs> SRCD. But this was our handout. So you had to give handouts back in the time. And that was, that was our actual handout, Henry. Um, and so let's see what else I found. This was submitting our first paper. Um, this was back, Mark Bornstein was editor of Child Development, and you had to mail five copies of a manuscript because they would actually mail it out to people. Um, this is an early typeset from Child Development in 1997. So you would get this before you would get the proofs, and they would show all the things that were going to be in there. And we had to carefully comb through that. This is once we finally started using email um, more regularly. These are comments on um, our 2001 paper. We were working on the discussion for it. And um, I'll send these to you later, Henry. I have a whole bunch of these things. Um, but it's just what I want to say about this, I don't, you're probably not going to be able to, to read this, but he's such an amazing storyteller. He's like a scientist storyteller. And so what a lot of what I really benefited from was I'd get so bogged down in the nitty gritty of all the data and everything, and he'd really be able to pull me back out and say, this is the big picture, this is the story that you're trying to tell. And um, even to this day, a lot of the themes in this are things that I you know, continue to pursue, so it's an amazing email. Um, this is just early coding scheme drafts of how we were gonna code the emotion talk, um, so I thought that was kind of fun. Okay, so I need to go back to the science now, too. This is the mixture of nostalgia and science. So building from this foundation, I left Michigan in 2001, started as an assistant professor at Davis, where I still am. And so I started to think about emotions, again, connected to other parts of time. And so looking at how children think about emotions connected to the future. And so 
what makes the future so interesting is like you can understand, well, young children, maybe they understand about emotions connected to the here and now because things are happening right now. Or maybe they understand connected to the past because those are events that actually happen. So sure, emotions can come from events that actually happen. But when you think about the future, it hasn't happened yet. So you're talking about reasoning about emotions based on possibilities of, of what could possibly happen next. And the other thing that's really intriguing about the future is that it's uncertain. So what you're thinking about is hypotheticals or what ifs about what could happen. And so I got really interested in how children would reason about emotions connected to this part of time. So consider the following scenario. So there's two girls and they're riding a two-person bicycle and they hit a bump and they fall off and they both hurt their arms and they both feel medium bad. Um, we did say they broke their arms because they're gonna get casts. So the critical concept that we're testing here is how their emotions might change based on how they're envisioning the future. So Amy thinks we broke our arms, now we both will get casts and our friends can write their names and draw pictures on them. So how does she feel right now? Erica thinks we broke our arms, now we'll both have to wear itchy casts and it will be hard for us to play with our friends. How does Erica feel right now? So again, they're in the same exact situation. The only thing that's differing between them is how they're mentally framing that event, and especially in relation to the future. And so what we found over a series of studies, and some of this even goes back to work I did with Henry, is that between the ages of four and 10, children increasingly understand that thinking optimistically makes, um, can improve your emotions. If you're thinking pessimistically about the future, it's gonna make you feel worse. And we also found that it really depends upon the context. So thoughts have their greatest impact in situations that are ambiguous or neutral versus have a clear valence to them. So for example, um, the, where, where they have the weakest influences is something bad is happening to you right now. So positive thinking when something bad is happening to you right now can improve your emotions somewhat and make you feel kind of towards neutral or less bad, but it's not gonna push you over the edge to actually feeling good. Negative thoughts they understand even from three and four years of age can make you feel terrible even if it's a positive event. So they kind of get the anti-coping much earlier than they understand that optimism can actually make you feel good. So there is connections between the current context too. In additional empirical work, we've examined the development of children's knowledge of how people's past experiences then carry through time to affect their future-oriented emotions. So let me give you an example of this scenario. So one day Adam trips on a rock and a big teenager boy helps him up and Adam feels happy. A few days later that the big teenager boy shares a remote control car with Adam and Adam feels happy. And then many days later Adam sees the big teenager boy and they're asked to predict and explain how Adam feels seeing the big teenager boy uh, on a scale that went from very worried to very happy. So in the scenario I just provided that was two positive past events um, in addition to scenarios featuring two positive past events, they also reasoned about scenarios where there was two negative events, such as a red-haired kid trying to throw a rock at you and then stealing your favorite toy, um, a negative followed by a positive, so first do something negative towards the person, try to shove them off the monkey bars, and later to rescue a kite from a tree, or a positive followed by negative, so gave a nice picture, but a few days later tried to shove off the swing. So the key question is, how do you integrate information from the past to make judgments about how they would feel when re-encountering the same person from before? And so what we've found over several studies is that children do exhibit some awareness of this as early as four to five years of age, which is very young, um, but they develop increasing sophistication into adulthood. And that is with increasing age, they expect the past to have a stronger biasing impact. They expect that to to be more powerful the older you get. And the other thing that's interesting is what about these ambiguous risk situations? So the way we would test this is um, different people would have different versions, so it was between subjects. But, sorry, it would be the same exact events, but just in reversed order. So she either shoved off the swing, then gave her a nice picture, or she gave her the nice picture and shoved off the swing. So what's really fascinating about this is that in this situation, Children and adults were more likely to say she feels on the positive side to see the short-haired girl again. Whereas in this version, they'd say she feels worried. 
seeing the short-haired girl again. And actually, adults would say she'd almost feel as worried as if she had done two negative events in the past. So what we're finding is that not all past events are equal. Kids, and increasingly as you get older, care much more about the last thing you did to someone, and that negative information in that most recent spot is what's carrying a lot of weight. We've also found that the negative in that last spot can even override frequency information. So even in this case where the short-haired girl did two nice things, gave a picture, gave cookies, but the last time she saw her, she tried to shove her off the swing, kids and adults will say, at least by six years of age, that she feels worried there. Um, so even recency overrides frequency. Okay, I'm gonna go faster. So the other thing we found between four to 10 and adults too is like, what about emotion generalization? It's not the case that you just have to see the same people again. Sometimes you're seeing people who share some sort of similarity. And we do find with increasing age that children understand more that people generalize from emotional events in the past, that you could feel worried seeing someone who just shares some similarity in category membership with someone before, and the intensity of that emotion will be stronger the more similar they look to the original person. We've also done work looking at how children connect all of these mental states together. So being able to form these mental state triads that if you think positively, you'll anticipate positively and you'll make approach decisions and same for negative emotions too. So this is very tied to sort of clinical literature as, as well. And we found that you know, four-year-olds can do this pretty well. The older you get, the more you do it. And where this breaks down the most is in uncertain situations. So in an ambiguous risk situation, like those negative, positive, positive, negative, you might feel a little happy. You might think that there's a chance that something good will happen, but you'll still avoid because there's still that uncertainty element to it. So I'm gonna go fast through this. Also looking at prior expectations and future emotions. So here's a scenario with two boys and they're eating dinner and they finish their dinner and one of them they're thinking about what they're gonna get for dessert and one of them is sure that the restaurant has cookie pie and the other one thinks, no, they don't have cookie pie. So when we ask them to rate their emotions, they think this person feels great and this person feels sad based on their expectations. But then we find out what happens. So either the waiter says, we don't have any cookie pie or in another variation says, hey, great, we do have cookie pie and they're asked to predict their emotions. And what we find with increasing age is that they understand that actually this positive thinking has a cost. So the person who thinks positively before actually won't feel as good um, as when, when expectations fall short. So when there's a negative outcome, the person who had the negative expectations actually feels better. Um, as they get older, they better understand that low expectations can carry an emotional benefit, sort of like surprising, pleasant surprise. And then it matters what you're thinking right before the outcome occurs. So the, the, out, the expectation exactly right before the outcome carries the most weight. I'm gonna just go through this fast because I know we're late for break too because we started late. We've looked at a lot of individual differences. There's a lot of things that correlate with this kind of reasoning. Um, probably the things I'm most interested, I'm really excited about is visual attention biases. We've been incorporating eye tracking into the things we're doing. And so you can see that same recency bias with how children and adults look at that emotional information too when they're making these judgments. So summing up, why are they feeling these ways? So what we found through a lot of this research and again this very foundational stuff that I started with Henry too is that um, consideration of potential emotion causes widens with age from features of the current situation to thinking about the past to thinking about the future with really mental states being that glue that holds all of these things across time. Um, and this knowledge about life history and mind and emotion, it's not, it starts in preschool. We can find very strong evidence for it in preschoolers, but it takes through middle childhood. And there's even differences from, from childhood up through um, adulthood too, and even a lot of individual variability in adulthood in this kind of reasoning. So it's very complex. Understanding emotions is very complex and really a lifelong achievement. And I just wanted to end in Henry's style of, well, what is the big picture? What, is, what does this all mean like theory-wise? Is that if you're really gonna develop a psychological understanding of people, it's not just about this belief, that desire, this other emotion. It's really, how do all these things connect together? How do our thoughts affect our emotions, affect our beliefs, affect our desires? 
And similarly, if we're trying to establish a psychological understanding of people, it's not just about understanding why Jane's looking in the cupboard instead of the refrigerator for her chocolate, these like isolated events. It's how do people's life history, how do all of these things accumulate over time and, and really affect how we come to understand each other and understand the world? And ideally what we're trying to do is not just to understand people in general, but to understand why this person and not this other person has these thoughts, has these beliefs, has these emotions, and so on. And so just to end, I just want this from 2001, just thank you. Thank you so much and congratulations on a brilliant career and I'm indebted so much for all the wonderful things that I've been able to do in my life too. So thank you, Henry. Yeah, I turned it back on. Um, oh, that was wonderful. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, we're going to hear from our next speaker, Mark Saba, who will be talking. Uh, his talk is entitled Different Theories, Different Brains. Is that okay for? Okay, thanks. Um, it was uh, encouraging to hear that our previous speakers had been through several versions of this talk because I did too. Um, I, I'm sure that's gonna be a common theme and it's partly because it's one that you really don't wanna mess up, right? Like, you know, it's somebody, when somebody's so important to you as Henry has been to me, uh, you wanna make sure you get it as close to right as you can. So you work on it and you do all these different uh, iterations and partly uh, and, and you're pretty sure you didn't get it right, or at least I'm pretty sure I didn't get it right, especially after seeing the other two. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, I'm gonna, but I'm just gonna speak from my heart a little bit. And what, one of the things that was uh, really also encouraging for me to uh, see was that everybody had their sort of like um, uh, exciting day uh, <laughs> with uh, Henry, whether it was picking him up from, the, uh, from, from his travel uh, to visit, give a talk, or um, you know, when you got the, uh, the notice. I actually probably have several of these days. Uh, one was at a conference where um, at, at around the same time uh, Kristen was applying to grad school, I was too, um, and I decided not to come to University of Michigan. I decided to go to uh, University of Oregon. And while I was at the University of Oregon, uh, I wrote a review of the book that uh, Henry wrote with Karen. Uh, Barch, uh, and and it was published in I don't know, Merrill Palm Quarterly or something like that, and uh, and I was sure that uh, Henry hadn't read it, um, uh, because why would he? And uh, and so I, so I'm at this so I'm at SRCD could have been SRCD uh, Indianapolis, uh, could have been uh, VC, and I I see Henry from across the room and he beelines over. Hey, that was a great review of our book. Thanks so much. I was like, "You, sorry, <laughs> uh, did you you read it?" And anyway, I was it was just so um, it was I was so moved because I, you know and proud and scared uh, because uh, it, I did I didn't expect that and I didn't expect somebody who was a, who was as famous to me as Henry is. Uh, to be so warm and open at that time. Uh, next thing I noticed, so uh, when I applied, when it was time for me to look for postdocs, I don't even, I wasn't even sheepish about it. I just sent him an email and I said, Henry, um, hi. <laughs> you may remember me from such events as turning you down for graduate school and <laughs> writing a review of your book. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna be a postdoc, he's like, okay. Sure, that, that, that should work. And so I came here. Uh, and, uh, and then, so that was, those, were, those were all special days, but then my first day here uh, was a, was a um, or I don't know if it was my first day here because there was all this orientation admin and stuff. Uh, I'd seen Susan around, 
because I, I was here to work with both Henry and Susan. And um, I'd seen Susan around, and I went to her office, because her she's always at East Hall, and her door's open. I go in, oh, hi. She's like, and you are? <laughs> I was like, Mark Savage. She's like, oh, hi. And it, but then Henry and I, we had to coordinate over the phone, because he spent most of his time over at CHGD. Uh, so we had to coordinate over the phone. And he's like, OK, why don't, you come, why don't you come meet with me? And I said, OK, great. And so I went over to CHGD, but then he came over to East Hall. Well, he said, like, let's meet in my office. I said, OK. So I went over to CHGD where he was, and he, he came back to East Hall. And so he called me at, CH, at his office in CHGD, and he's like, um, I think we might have got our wires crossed. Uh, anyway, so that was not my first exciting day with Henry. My second one uh, was the uh, one that I'm going to tell you about today, where um, I wanted to find out something that we could do together. And I had just done, uh, I had just come from the University of Oregon, where I was really, uh, I became really interested in connections between mind and brain, and how we can, how we can understand cognitive development from a neurobiological perspective, and in particular, how we could understand social cognitive development from a neurobiological perspective. Um, I had just done some work looking at um, adults and how they, how you know, the neural correlates or the neural systems that are recruited as young as adults reason about other people's mental states, doing like theory of mind type stuff. And I wondered about the extent to which we might be able to apply this to kids and how we might get, how it might be profitable to think about kids. And I, so I was really preparing for my meeting, and I was like, you know, Henry had just done all this really amazing work with uh, Allison uh, Gopnik about uh, on theory theory, and I started to think like, you know. One of the things we might be able to do with neurobiological measures is we might be able to see whether you know, there are important changes that happen when you know, kids who have one kind of theory about the way the world, maybe they're desire theorists, to use Henry's term, whether their brains, as they're processing um, theory of mind type scenarios, whether they look really different from how the brains of uh, so kids who are more like belief desire theorists, to use, again, Henry's terms, whether their brains look different. And I said, you know, different theories, do they have different brains? And uh, Henry was, uh, so I, you know, I was kind of really excited about this idea that maybe we could do this. And Henry was kind of skeptical. And I don't know if you all, I don't, some of you probably worked with Henry and maybe seen this kind of quizzical look that <laughs> Henry can give you sometimes. When you, when you sort of uh, float something like this, he's like, different theories, different brains. He's like, I don't know, man. Uh, <laughs> and then he said, Newton and Einstein, uh, really different theories, same brain. And I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm not sure about that, uh, about their same brain, because I know that they had different brains because they were different people. <laughs> but, but, the, but the point was still a really good one about, like, how would you ever index? You know, it's this kind of really kind of clear, skeptical insight that pushes you to think about it a little bit more. And so in the moment, I started saying, well, no, you know, it wouldn't be about stuff like, you know, it'd be like maybe a, maybe a Belief theorists would be, you know, doing more like logico-inductive type stuff, whereas a desire theorist maybe would be a little bit more something like this. And uh, he kind of cut me off in the middle of this of my spiel. And he said, "I don't know, friend. Sounds a little goofy." And I don't know. Do you all know this? Have you all, has anybody heard Henry use this term? I, I'm almost I'm almost scared to ask because I feel like probably he used it with me a lot. <laughs> uh, but he called it goofy. And uh, he says, it sounds a little goofy. And I was like, goofy? Does it mean ridiculous, silly, wacky, nutty? I felt pretty embarrassed. And then I was talking, Anne, Anne, uh, Anne Phillips was here at the time, and I was like, have you ever heard Henry say goofy? She's like, yeah, I've heard him say it a lot. I was like, <laughs> and anyway, so, but I don't think he meant it was ridiculous, silly, wacky, or nutty. I think he meant what it was, it was not quite thought through. It was a little bit half-baked. Um, but I think more to the point, I think what I learned more at the time was that it was inelegant. My idea is they weren't, they didn't, they were inelegant. They required substantial mental gymnastics. They were difficult to evaluate. Probably not the best place <laughs> to start a new line or program of research. That's probably what he meant <laughs> when he said it was goofy. So, um, so it was, so that was, that was my big day <laughs> when I got told I was goofy by Henry. Um, and that's when we started to kind of try to figure out whether 
So it wasn't going to be my different theories, different brains idea, but it was going to be just something a little more tractable about how you know, we could just ask, are there neurodevelopmental changes that correspond with children's acquisition of false belief understanding? So that's as much more kind of, that's, yeah, well, that's a question that you could maybe answer. <laughs> and, and we got started on what would then be a, you know, a decade or so worth of ERP studies uh, to try to address this. So, um, and it turned, but one of the things that I'll always be uh, grateful to Henry for uh, was the opportunity to start this work in his lab because it was really, really, really time consuming and hard um, for lots and lots and lots of reasons. Um, but one of them is just because of the, the method that we had to use, it was ERP. So I don't know if you all know about ERP, but what ERP is is the recording of brain electrical activity like directly from the scalp. And what you do in order to index how a brain responds to a particular stimulus is that you show a particular stimulus to a kid and then you record their brain activity. But of course, at any one time, you can't see what's happening in the brain because there's all this noise happening in it too. So what you have to do is you have to do signal averaging. You have to show it to them not just once, not just twice, but up to 30 or 40 times. And then you average all that together and then the part that's associated with their actual processing of that stimulus, that's constant throughout and so it shows up and all the stuff that was just thinking about dinner or whatever, that goes away, that averages out so you get these nice clean signals. That's what's illustrated here. But how do you do this for theory of mind? Like how do you, how do you give, I mean basically what this is gonna require, if we're gonna use this method, we have to figure out how to give you know, kids of the kind, that, the sort that we're used to studying 30 or 40 false belief trials. And um, how, do you, how do you do that? How do you do that? Can, can you, young kids even tolerate it? Can you sit there? Can you make a meaningful experience for kids in this time? Um, and if you do it, are we even measuring the same thing as if we just do one at a time, you know, in the nor sort of normal way we do it of doing like three or four at a time? Like, is it even close to being the same thing? So we had so much work to do like even before we started to ask that, you know, get to that question that we wanted to ask, we had to ask all this other stuff first. We had to do all this extra work for it too. I, I'll also add that although um, use of brain electrical um, ERP, EEG, brain electrical recordings to do this was, um, it was common with infants at the time, infants who were kind of, uh, acquiescent and sit still for you, I mean, more or less, um, and don't have much of a say in the matter anyway. Uh, and it's also, it was also pretty common with older kids, like adolescents and stuff like that. But there was not anything that we knew about at the time that was actually done with sort of four to seven year olds. So the, whether or not we were gonna be able to just even record, even get a four to seven year old sit through this was uh, 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 unknown. Um, we did have one four to seven year old in our, in our, uh, in our midst, and it was Caitlin, whose uh, signature you already uh, saw earlier. Um, so Caitlin came into the lab. So in her early days, and this was just like, can we put electrodes on a little girl's head and record brain activity from it? And obviously Caitlin, pretty precocious special kid, um, but it was terrible experience for me. Um, <laughs> It was so bad. Um, the system that we used, we adapted. We were we were working with Bill Gehring from the um, from what, I don't know what the program's called, Cognitive or CPAP or something like that program here, and uh, CCN. CCN. Maybe it was called was it called something else? Or, uh, anyway, <laughs> sorry. Cognitive. <laughs> the cognitive people, and I'm sure they're I'm sure they're fine. Uh, so we were doing so we were doing this with them and uh, with Bill, and so we brought Caitlin in the lab, and we put and we were using this system that where you had to like inject gel and and put tape uh, on some of these electrodes. And uh, Caitlin, you didn't see I, you did see a picture of her. She's like Kristen, beautiful, long flowing blonde hair, and it got all caught up in her hair, and she was this big mess, and it was so nasty. And I'm like pulling this tape out of her hair, and she's like, "Ow!" And then I felt so bad. Um, and at the end, Caitlin gave me a big hug. She said, it's okay. <laughs> so what we wondered was whether, so I had done it with adults before where, 
And the way we did it with adults is that we'd had them read these stories. They would just read these stories line by line. They would kind of develop a false belief scenario just reading these stories, and then we would test them. The idea behind the scenario, in case you're interested, is that you would, you would have the scene where somebody would put something in one place, and they would put something else in another place, and then, uh, and then they would leave the scene, and then somebody else would come back, or somebody, you know, a third person or a second person would come in, and they would move one of the things while leaving the other thing the same. And so the idea was that you had a true belief about the location of one thing and a false belief about the location of the other. And then we could ask this question, like according to Maggie, where is the clipboard? And that, either that's the thing that moved or the thing that didn't move. And the idea was people wouldn't know that they were being asked to reason about a false belief until they got to the very end of the sentence. And that's when we would record their brain activity, right at that moment when they had to reason about a false belief. So pretty smart, I think. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, so we made, so, but, uh, but you may not know this, but four-year-old's not great at reading uh, <laughs> like this. So. Uh, I mean, most of them. Caitlin, prob Caitlin probably fine, but so, but we couldn't count on Caitlin, especially after I tore her hair out. Uh, so, uh, so we made we made these scenarios here, these uh, these animated scenarios, where it's basically the same thing except that um, uh, it's Garfield and he puts one thing in one box, one thing in another box, and then they move. And then these were both these were all things that could move on their own. And then he would come forward and he would sing the song. And while he was singing this song, one of the things would move and the others would stay put. And then we'd ask, and then this was narrated by a person who was actually in the room with the kid wearing a hat. Where does Garfield think this is? And we'd flash him the thing with the true or the false belief. And we would ask, or, and then we would also ask, where is this really? Uh, and, or really, where is this? And we would flash him. Uh, we would get the ERP as they're thinking about either where something really is or where something is thought to be by the person. Uh, and that's, that's what we did. And so, you know, we had to, so we did a long pilot study, I don't know if Henry remembers, where we developed, I developed, I think, 20 of these that we could give to kids, um, which was not the total that we would ultimately wind up needing for the ERP work, but it was along the way, because we thought, well, if this isn't gonna work, it's not gonna work. So we got 20 of these, and we got about 30 kids in to see like, how they would just perform on this task, and whether it correlated with their regular false belief performance, their regular false belief performance, and it did, and we were delighted. Um, so then we moved on to a second pilot study, so you know, we're however far into this now we are. We moved on to a second, oh, and I should, I should, oh, I should mention also at this point, um, David Liu came in to, to help out. Uh, he was a graduate student working with Henry at the time who was really intrigued by many, many things, in, including this. And so David worked with us on this. Um, and David actually did, the, f did uh, the first pilot study, a lot of the first pilot study with Bill Gehring. Our first question was whether we would get the same findings with adults using our um, new nonverbal task. Uh, and it turned out we did, so it's this left slow wave dissociation that happens over the left um, anterior frontal areas here. That's associated, so in the study that I did with Marjorie Taylor ages ago, uh, that's what we found. And then the one we did just using that exact same paradigm that I just showed you, we got the exact same uh, pattern of results. This was so encouraging for us. And then we went forward um, to do this. You wanna find out, we looked also at how kids did in the task I already mentioned. What was so great was that uh, even though we're giving them 30 or 40, you know, 20, 30, 40 of these things, uh, of these tasks, their performance was super consistent across them, which was not something that we totally expected, but it was. So if they were failures, they were failures for the most part. If they were passers, they were passers for the most part. Not a lot of kids kind of just willy-nilly in the middle. They were, so one of the things that was really cool about this that we didn't really explore or publish at the time was that, you know, this suggests that there was this consistency in their responding across so many trials really indicates that they were answering on the basis of something. It was not just random responding, which was definitely a theory at the time. And we could rule that out. But it also gave us this nice distribution of passers and failures that we could then look at. So do passers and failures have different brain activity? So finally, we're there. And it turns out they do. So the adults, we replicated with the adults there. They have that same left frontal dissociation. The child passers do all, as well. It's a little bit later in their epic, but it's the exact same pattern of activity. And the child failers, lack of a better term, failers, they don't show that, they don't show that activity at all. So that journey that I just went through in about five minutes took seven years. Uh, to do, 
Uh, we learned that children who are successful at false belief reasoning recruit different neural populations to solve those problems relative to children who aren't good at false belief reasoning. And the specific nature of that difference, so, you know, one of the things that we, uh, so there's a basic kind of research neuroscience-y empirical question is do their brains differ? And that's cool that they do, but what does it mean? Uh, why, why is that important? Why is that interesting? And well, you know, the, the neat thing about brains is that there's a whole literature on what they do, and <laughs> you may be familiar with it. Uh, uh, there's a whole literature on what they do, and it turns out, and, and especially in ERP, there's like a long literature about what the left, what these left anterior frontal slow wave dissociations are all about. And these are about, these are typically about, you know, especially seen and recruited in places where kids are doing logical inductive reasoning. So where they're doing this kind of logical inductive reasoning, which suggested that there's something special about the, 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 for, the kids who are passing these tasks are recruiting mechanisms of induction in a way that kids who were not passing these tasks were not doing at the time. So that's a little bit more cool. Uh, uh, about that, uh, telling us, you know, it, it played into a whole bunch of different theories about uh, kids' false belief development, kids' social cognitive development, and showing that it's really, that it, that it is a, a neurocognitively special thing that they're doing, a, at least a little bit here, relative to some other things. And a lot more work followed, and uh, I was joking with uh, Lindsay that she could give this part of the talk, but I, I, I'm gonna give it. <laughs> It seemed wrong to put her on the spot. Uh, Lindsay Bowman, uh, along with David Liu and a whole bunch of other folks, went on to show, to follow this work up to show that, um, to get, provide evidence that uh, reasoning about beliefs and desires, so again, getting more into that, some of those important theoretical distinctions, that those actually rely on uh, slightly different brain areas as well, in the sense that uh, reasoning about other people's mental states generally seems to recruit these frontal areas pretty well, whether it's beliefs or desires, but if you're reasoning about beliefs, one of the things you're gonna see is a little bit more activation in the posterior parietal areas, in particular, probably the right temporal parietal juncture. Um, uh, Lindsay showed that both with ERP in a study with uh, David Liu, and then here with Yulia, who I think I saw. Hi, Yulia. Uh, this is um, uh, some FNIR's work that they did together. Um, how am I doing on time? Great, perfect. Um, I, uh, I, I took, I um, did some work on it myself. I'm just gonna go through it briefly with you. Uh, uh, where we looked at not, not event-related potentials, but just using EEG as a measure of neuromaturational uh, processes in the brain to show that kids who had um, uh, uh, evidence of, function, uh, of um, greater functional maturation in the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex and the right temporal parietal juncture, those were kids who did better at false belief. That was positively correlated with their false belief performance. That was independent of age and other aspects of cognitive development, in particular executive functioning. So this is again showing that these, these same areas, what's really interesting about this finding is that it's the same, uh, these are the same two areas that are most commonly recruited by adults too. So at the very core of this, like just as kids are, are kind of making this transition of false belief understanding, the brain areas that seem to be correlated with that in four-year-olds are the same ones that wind up being important for us, re making those same judgments when we're adults. Um, Lindsay has some studies that show this really um, beautifully. Um, uh, we had the opportunity to bring some of the kids back for our e who did our EEG stuff. Uh, they went through and did some fMRI work. And what uh, Lindsay showed there was that functional development of the theory of mind area and DMPFC at age four predicted its fMRI response to theory of mind tasks at age seven. So showing that there's this kind of a developmental continuity that you know, however, however much that brain area is developed at four, that goes on to predict how selective it's gonna be when it's reasoning about theory of mind uh, at seven. For the most part, I've, I've continued to be super inspired by uh, the frameworks that Henry developed um, in, in collaboration with Alison Gopnik um, uh, in, the, in the sort of mid-90s and about theory theory, um, and I've wondered about how those might, so kind of, you know, I never really got rid of my question about different brains, different, different theories, different brains, but I've, I've learned to ask it, I think, a little bit better. One of the things that I've always been intrigued by is this hypothesis testing metaphor that's, uh, that's core to theory theory, and the idea is, you know, kids have ideas about the world, and then they go and kind of test those ideas, and they, get the results, and when the results don't conform with hypothesis, when there's these prediction outcome mismatch, then that's your clue 
that you need to uh, change your mind. Um, you know, and uh, when I was hanging out with some of my uh, friends at Queens, it, it became clear that that's actually a lot of the ways in which people talk about dopaminergic functioning in the brain. And when we looked um, at, our find, at these DMPFC findings here, it turns out that you know, it's basically that same area of the DMPFC is right at the end of the mesofrontal dopamine system. So we started to think, oh, maybe dopamine's got something to do with this. Uh, we did a handful of studies about this. Uh, spontaneous blink is a, um, is a uh, uh, correlate, behavioral correlate of uh, dopaminergic functioning. That's associated with kids' theory of mind, how much they're blinking when they're just sitting around at four. Uh, that's correlated with their theory of mind. DRD4, a um, genetic uh, uh, marker of frontal dopamine binding, is associated with uh, theory of mind. And then our latest thing is this idea about wiggling, um, that kids, we've all, we've all been there. Uh, you know, some kids are, can really sit still, and then other kids have a hard time with that. Turns out that the, the, less, the more difficult it is for you to sit still, uh, the worse you do at theory of mind. Um, and it's here, now that I'm, I'm wrapping up, that I would like to have a picture of Henry and say thanks, and I don't have one. Um, <laughs> um, and this actually makes me feel, I feel pretty awkward about it. Um, and it's in part because, you know, I mentioned on my first day hanging out uh, in Henry, with Henry, uh, you know, and um, if, you, if you sit in his office, uh, one of the things I think you'll notice is that there's pictures. There's pictures from all of his different kind of, you know, his work pictures and, and family pictures and things like that. But there's all these pictures of him in the community and his, with, he's hanging out with his friends, he's hanging out with his students, he's hanging, you know, you all got those pictures from somewhere and I bet Henry just pulled them off of his bulletin board and showed them to you in some cases. Um, and, uh, and I don't, you know, when you're, for me, it was, it was really special to see that because you see that this is somebody who really cares about his community, cares about his obligations to not just the science and, and being a hard-ass scientist, but also about his community and the friendships and the relationships. And so um, it, was, it was really, I, th and that's always been a big part of my relationship with Henry and, I, and I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful for the friendship and the mentorship, for the caring and encouragement as well as all of the um, uh, science that we were able to do together. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Henry. Yeah. Well, I. Well, yeah. Oh, can you take a picture? Thank you, Mark. That was amazing. <laughs> Jackie. Jackie Woolley is our next speaker. She will talk about the nature and development of children's concepts of luck. Test, test. Sounds good. Thank you, Susan, for organizing this great event. I'm really honored to be a part of it. I feel very lucky to have had Henry as my advisor. So my uh, original talk um, 
consisted of all of the reasons that I am lucky to have had Henry as my advisor. Um, and that ended up taking the whole 25 minutes. So, uh, and Susan wanted it to be part research and part sort of anecdotes. So I scrapped that and I narrowed it down to a couple of things that I learned from Henry and a couple of things that I admire about him. So first, you can be friends with people with whom you disagree theoretically. So my first year or so of graduate school, I came to realize that Henry and Joseph Perner were having some pretty intense theoretical debates about theory of mind and specifically children's false belief understanding. And I was pretty sure they must really hate each other. Um, and so I went to, I remember going to this little theory of mind conference, I think it was in, in Canada or something, and seeing the two of them approach each other in the conference hall and bracing myself for you know, a duel or you know, at least like some kind of angry confrontation. So imagine my surprise when they greeted each other warmly. I don't know, they shook hands and started chatting and then went off to, you know, to have coffee or to talk about research or something. So this made a huge impression on me. So the thing to note there is you really never know what's going through the minds of your first year graduate students. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy things, we think. Okay, so I learned all, how to write from being Henry's graduate student. So this is how it would work. I would prepare, you know, like 20 drafts of some document um, and then I would print it out and turn it into Henry, probably told him it was the first draft, but maybe. Um, <laughs> and then he would write, you know, he'd start by always being encouraging, writing good start at the top of it. <laughs> and then he would proceed to cover over pretty much everything I had written with his own version of the paper that he had scrawled on yellow legal pad paper. Um, and Basically, the final version was like completely yellow, except for these few little places where my valiant attempts at writing would kind of peek through. Um, and so I think I learned how to write by kind of removing the tape and the legal pad and kind of lining it up next to what I had written and trying to figure out why the way he said it was better than the way I said it. And I also learned to write good start at the top of all my students' papers. <laughs> I also admire Henry's, I admire Henry's intellectual bravery. And I, I really admire the fact in particular that he decided to work with infants after spending a lot of his career working with preschool ch and older children. Um, I think one of my most traumatic moments in graduate school was when Henry sent me into the trenches of the two-year-old classroom to study their theories of mind. Have you, any of you worked with two-year-olds? <laughs> yeah, so basically, first of all, they didn't want to come to the testing room with me in the first place, but if I could ever get them to come to the testing room, they would immediately tell me they had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so then we would do that, and then, you know, 10 minutes later we would come back, and then I would start asking them my questions. And they would either say yes to everything I asked them, or probably no is more likely. Um, and then if I could ever get them to say anything, and I would ask them why they thought what they did, and they inevitably told me it was because their mother told them so, like every single time they said that. So I haven't worked with them since, let alone babies. <laughs> Okay, um, I have a lot of memories of being Henry's teaching assistant. Um, and this one memory might be something that Henry doesn't remember at all. I'm not sure, I guess we'll find out. Um, but I remember sitting in a large lecture room like this, except that it had a big stage. And Henry was up on stage, you know, really wrapped up in whatever he was lecturing out, you know, pacing back and forth as he was doing this. And at some point, I noticed something kind of appeared at the bottom of his pant leg. And I kind of looked at it, and he kept kind of walking back and forth, and it kept growing and growing. I was pretty sure it was a giant squid axon, I remember. Um, but anyway, he kept pacing back and forth, and the giant squid axon kept getting longer and longer. Well, okay, so it wasn't a giant squid axon in the end, but rather it was this kind of athletic tape that you wrap around your knee when you have knee problems. Do you remember this? <laughs> Anyway, so what I learned from that is that, you know, intellectual issues are always at the forefront of Henry's consciousness, sometimes at the expense of more mundane matters. <laughs> so I said I was lucky to have had Henry as my advisor. So what did I mean by that? Well, people talk about and think about luck in basically three different ways. As a supernatural causal force aimed at bringing about good outcomes, um, as an explanation for certain kinds of events, like usually unexpected ones, and then also as a personal trait. So luck as a supernatural causal force can be harnessed through the use of lucky charms. 
And this picture on the left is a museum exhibit of lucky objects. Um, luck could also be invoked through, through the use of superstitious rituals. Um, and what you'll see up here in this other picture is uh, Obama playing basketball. I don't know if you know this, but he had a ritual that he had to play basketball on the morning of every primary election. That was his lucky ritual. And then finally, uh, the picture over there is, uh, I couldn't get the exact thing, but it's meant to be a parking angel. So when I was in graduate school in Ann Arbor, I had a parking angel that I would put on my rear view mirror, and whenever I needed to find a parking space near campus, I would rub it and recite a particular rhyme. <laughs> I have some, if anyone wants them, I have some for sale. <laughs> Don't need them anymore. Okay, luck is also used as an explanation for certain kinds of events. So in this one, the New York Times titled their article, Luck, Not Tougher Building Standards, Spared Mexico in Quake. So basically they were explaining why more people hadn't died um, from this very serious, devastating earthquake in Mexico. And then finally, some people just think of themselves as lucky people or unlucky people. So luck is often used sort of as a personal trait. Okay, so be, you might be thinking, well, maybe luck doesn't really mean any of these things. We just use it in a colloquial sense. You know, we wish people good luck all the time, and it just means I hope you do well. But there is research that shows that adults hold beliefs in luck in all three of these senses, as a supernatural causal force, as a satisfying explanation for events, and as a personal trait. And there's also some research that shows that 63% of US adults have at least one superstition and 72% have at least one good luck charm. And to me, this is kind of concerning because it suggests that a large proportion of our population is decidedly irrational, <laughs> which you may already have known. But to explore this with my graduate student, Kelsey Kelly, we gave children interviews to, there wasn't much work on luck at the time, so we sort of started with this open-ended interview. Um, and then we followed it with some more targeted vignettes that looked at how kids explain events. And we studied four, six, eight, and 10-year-olds in Austin, Texas. I'll show you here just some of the responses to our interview questions. On the y-axis is percentage of yes responses, and then we have the four, six, eight, and 10-year-olds um, on the x-axis. So um, most of the kids said that they had experienced good luck at some point in their lives, even four-year-olds. Um, and a lot of kids had experienced bad luck as well. And I think what's interesting about this graph is if you look at the green lines, that's the four-year-olds, they were much more likely to say they'd experienced good luck than bad luck. And that was also true for the six-year-olds. But the 10-year-olds said that they'd experienced both good and bad luck kind of equally, which is kind of interesting. And, and we didn't really know why at the time, but we thought it might be that maybe um, adults talk more about good luck to their younger children. I mean, we know that adults endorse positive, fantastical beings a lot more than they endorse negative ones. So that kind of seemed to fit. Um, about a third of the kids had some kind of lucky object, like a lucky charm, or a, a lot of these were uh, sort of per, um, personal, but some were also cultural, like a lucky rock. Um, about a third of them also had some kind of lucky ritual that they did to bring themselves luck. Um, these were mostly personal, like uh, taking off your socks before a math test or something like that. Um, a lot of kids thought they were lucky. That's nice. Um, <laughs> but interestingly, uh, more older kids thought that everyone was lucky. And we don't really know why that this was exactly, except that it may come along with a, an increasing understanding of luck as chance. So with, with kind of a luck as chance model, everybody would kind of have equal probability of being lucky. And then finally, we saw a fairly strong belief in luck, even in the four-year-olds, a very strong belief in luck in the six and eight-year-olds, but then the 10-year-olds are sort of starting to wonder. So with regard to the vignettes, we know from Allison's work and the work of other people that children are explanation seekers. They're always asking why, they always want to know the causes of events. Um, and we know from Henry's, Henry's work and Susan's work and lots of other work of other people here that children have a host of natural explanations that they use for events. So they have their theories of mind and their theories of physics and their theories of biology that they use to explain all kinds of things. But adults have a whole host of supernatural explanations that they slash we, none of us, but they <laughs> use to explain events. So, uh, adults refer to things like luck and God and fate and karma to explain events. 
And we wondered, you know, I wondered, where do these come from? Are these things that we just kind of pick up as adults? Is there any possibility that maybe children use these kinds of explanation as well? So that's what the vignettes addressed. We specifically in this study focused on luck. Um, and we were interested in how children use these kind, this kind of explanation. So did they just use it sort of across the board? So is everything lucky to a little kid? Or are they more principled? And when adults use luck to explain events, adults usually focus on two factors, emotional valence and likelihood. Um, so basically, we tend to use luck to explain um, positive events and negative events, but not so much just neutral events. Um, and then we also tend to use luck um, when we face something that's unexpected versus something that's just mundane or ordinary. And so in the vignettes, we systematically varied emotional valence and likelihood. Um, and then we asked, well, I'll tell you what uh, the vignettes looked like. These are some kind of abridged versions of the vignettes. Um, across the top, you'll see positive, negative, and neutral, and then expected and unexpected on the left. So just to give you an example of a positive expected story, Jack made plans with all of his friends to go to the park. Jack got to the park, and all of his friends were there, just positive expected. Um, versus Max, who had basketball practice after school. And one day, all of his friends were going to a movie after school, but he couldn't go. But when he got to the gym, it was flooded, so he didn't have basketball practice, and he got to go to the movie. So positive, but expected. And then we asked children after they heard the vignettes how much luck caused the outcome. And we gave them three choices, from not at all to a little to a lot. Zero, one, two. So here you see on the y-axis, zero to two, how much did luck cause the outcome. Um, and we see that children used luck to explain positive events and negative events about equally, but more than they used it to explain just neutral sorts of events. And then here you see unexpected events in blue and uh, expected events in orange. And if you look at the four and six-year-olds, they didn't really differentiate. So they used luck to explain expected events and unexpected events just kind of equally. It's just kind of really for the younger ones, it was just you know, good stuff that happened. Um, and then the eight-year-olds kind of started to differentiate. And then it wasn't until, until 10 that they were using luck more for unexpected things you know, as adults do. Um, and they also, as you can see, you know, it just kind of goes down overall. So um, as kids got older, they were really kind of less likely that luck caused things in general. OK, so just summing up, um, many kids reported that they'd experienced luck, both good and bad, so good more than bad in the younger ones. Um, a lot of the kids that we tested had lucky charms or lucky rituals. Their concepts included ideas about personal luckiness and other people's luckiness. Uh, we saw moderate belief by age four, stronger belief in six and eight-year-olds, and doubt was kind of um, appearing by 10. And then also their use of luck to explain things seemed to get more, co more complex and nuanced with age. So this research showed us, I think, that children have a really rich concept of luck. And so I had to wonder where they get these ideas about luck. So work by Paul Harris and his colleagues has shown that they've really highlighted how difficult it is for kids to learn about unobservable things like germs and angels because they don't have firsthand experience with these kinds of things. Um, and so they really need to rely heavily on the testimony of other people. But unlike germs, luck isn't taught in science class. But maybe it's talked about at home. So we thought maybe you know, parents encourage beliefs in things like Santa Claus and magic, so maybe they encourage beliefs in luck as well. Now, when we asked children in the previous study where they'd heard about luck, about a third of them told us that they'd heard of it from the testimony of other people. So we thought, well, let's, we could look at that. Um, and so we looked at how adults talk to children about luck. And we used the Childish Database, which people have mentioned already today. It's an online um, program where you can sort of look at children's conversations with adults. And you can pick out what words you want to look at. Um, and we looked at use of luck and lucky. Uh, and we focused on conversations with children between the ages of two and seven. What did we find? Well. Against our expectations, adults rarely referred to luck as a supernatural causal force. They hardly ever talked about lucky charms, hardly ever talked about lucky rituals. Oh well. Against our expectations, adults also used luck to refer more to mundane events than to unexpected events. This is the opposite of what we had expected, so that wasn't helpful. Um, we also found that adults used luck to refer to positive and negative events equally, which was kind of 
mixed with regard to our expectations. I mean, kids, you know, used explained positive and negative events about the same amount, but they also reported they'd experienced more good than bad luck. So we kind of didn't really feel like this was helping us, but understand, you know, children's rich concepts. But what did parents do? Well, they mostly used the word lucky to refer to kind of um, being fortunate. So they said things like, oh, you're so lucky you got so many birthday presents, you know, things like that, which is interesting. And it, it explains some things, you know, like maybe why kids thought they were lucky. But we didn't really feel like it gave us an understanding of the really rich concepts that they seemed to have. So we had to figure out where to go next. And um, with that same question that I asked in the first study about where kids had heard about luck, about 45% of the kids said that they had heard about it through books and TV. So we thought we would try that. So um, as we know, Henry has done some work with Marilyn Schatz on um, children's learning from storybooks. And a lot of other people have done that kind of work. And they've shown that storybooks can be a really rich source of knowledge for kids and that kids can learn a whole lot from storybooks. So we um, found uh, 60 storybooks with the words luck and lucky in the title. Um, we coded a lot of things, but I'll focus on three today. The first was whether luck was portrayed as a causal force in the book. And to do this, we looked at sort of the source of luck or the origin of luck. So was it an object, um, like a lucky charm? Was it a behavior, like a lucky ritual? Uh, was it some kind of lucky entity, like a leprechaun or something? Um, secondly, we looked at whether the books focused on good luck or bad luck, how much they focused on each. And then also, to try to get a sense of um, this strong belief that kids seem to have in luck, we coded the reality status of the main character and the setting of the book. So was it a real character? Was it a realistic setting? Or was it kind of fantastical? We found that the majority of the books address the sources of luck multiple times. Many of the books referred to a lucky object, like a bad luck chair. Um, others referred to lucky actions or rituals, like wearing a belt a certain way to bring good luck. Um, and others referred to lucky entities, like a leprechaun. Um, the books referred primarily to good luck, uh, more than bad luck. And interestingly, the books portrayed luck in a realistic context. So it was a primarily realistic characters, realistic setting, which I think is interesting because in some of my own previous work where I presented novel entities to children, we found that if we presented them in a realistic context, they were much more likely to believe that they existed than if we presented them in a fantastical context. So this kind of fits with maybe the strong belief that we found in that first study. Now, one interesting thing that we found that we weren't expecting in these books, though, was that a lot of the books presented an alternative explanation for lucky outcomes. So some of the books said that, or suggested, that maybe having a lucky charm made the character try harder. Um, or maybe having a lucky charm made the character more hopeful. And so this inspired the last study that I'll mention to you today. Now, a little background, you know, as many of you know uh, or believe, superstitious rituals are historically thought of as being irrational. Um, but so, you know, using things like lucky charms to get outcomes, um, use, you know, playing basketball before primaries, actually Obama did both of these, um, are just really thought to be, you know, not to reflect rational behavior. But, there's some recent research that shows some positive effects of superstitious behavior on both emotion and cognition and ultimately outcomes. So for example, some research by Damish et al. shows that participants who used a lucky golf ball actually made more putts than participants who used a regular golf ball. And they attribute this to increased self-efficacy. There's also research that shows, emerging research, that shows positive effects of superstitious pre-performance rituals on outcomes in both golf and basketball. And the mechanisms here are thought to be um, increased confidence, uh, decreased anxiety, and increased sense of control. So 
<laughs> Thanks to Henry and many of you, you, we know that children have a rich, naive psychology that holds that our beliefs shape our behavior and that our behavior shapes our beliefs and emotions. So I wondered if it was possible that children might view superstitious behavior in this way as shaping our mental states. So to look at this, um, Paula Baca, my graduate student, Kelsey Kelly and I looked at six to nine year olds and adults um, and we presented them with vignettes in which characters who usually engage in, engage in some superstitious behavior fail to do it and then a negative outcome results. So just to give you an example, Annie is a great speller and loves being in the yearly spelling bee and always wins first place. Before every spelling bee, she always taps the front of her dictionary five times. But yesterday, she forgot to tap her dictionary before going on stage. During the spelling bee, she messed up on an easy word and lost in the first round. And then we asked children how connected the behavior was to the outcome. So how connected was Annie not tapping the book and her losing the spelling bee? Okay. And what we found was that on about two-thirds of the trials, participants said that the events were connected. And so we proceeded then to ask them for explanations for why they were connected. So in this graph, you see a percentage of natural and supernatural explanations that children and adults gave. The natural is in blue and the orange represents supernatural. The first thing to notice is that there were very few supernatural explanations at all. Slightly more in the children, but not very many at all. And you see a nice increase with age in the percentage of natural explanations. But one thing that I do want to point out is that among the children, 70% used a natural or psychological explanation at some point during the session. Here are some examples of what we got. One child said, she's just thinking about it too much and didn't focus. Another said, because the tapping made her remember, it made her confident. Another one said, maybe because she was stressed. And then another one said, tapping is something she does to stay on track. So I see at least two implications of these findings. Um, one is that they, they suggest that you might kind of need to revise our views about the rationality of superstitious behavior and maybe think about when and how superstitious behavior could be considered rational. I also think these findings are important because they show that ch children's theories of mind extend to this new territory, uh, supernatural thinking. And in general, I think the findings testify to the reach of children's theories of mind. And then finally, something that I also learned from Henry is the importance of soliciting explanations from young children. So remember that many of the, of the children said that the behavior was connected to the outcome. And so if we only had those data, we might think, oh, well, children are magical thinkers. They think that there's this supernatural force connecting superstitious behavior to these outcomes. But with the explanations, we see that children's thinking about lucky, children's thinking about lucky outcomes reflects this awareness of the mental states like beliefs and emotions that underlie this relation between uh, the superstitious behavior and the lucky outcome. And this beliefs and desires and emotions is something that we know so much more about because of Henry, and I think we're all much luckier because of it. <laughs> Thanks to my lab. Oh, thank you, Jackie, that was so fascinating. Um, you're all invited to a reception that will be on this floor in the uh, psychology atrium. Okay, welcome back everyone. Our next speaker uh, will be presenting via a pre-recorded talk. Um, this is Paul Harris at Harvard University, and the, the title of his talk is Henry's Relationship with the Young and the Old. And we will get this started. Uh, Let me start by uh, thanking Susan Gelman for organizing this event for Henry. Um, I very much wish <clears throat> I could be with you all in Michigan in person. 
So I want to say a few words about my connection with Henry and especially what I've admired about um, his work. So let me start uh, at the beginning, so to speak, when I first met him in the late 70s. I was teaching in uh, the Netherlands at the Free University in Amsterdam, and a group of enterprising, adventurous psychology students decided <clears throat> that it would be fun to do a tour of universities in the northeast of the US. Uh, the plan was to move from one city to another in a kind of retinue of three uh, RVs. And I was a faculty member who served, admittedly, very nominally, as the tour leader. Well, one of the important stops on our route was um, Michigan. Harold Stevenson had kindly agreed that <clears throat> the students could visit the university, park the RVs overnight in one of the university parking lots, and he met with the students the following day. And he told them about his ongoing research. And if I remember correctly, um, he generously invited them over to a barbecue at his home for good measure, good measure. But for me, the highlight of the visit to Michigan was the chance to meet and talk with Henry for the first time. So at that particular point, um, together with two colleagues in Amsterdam, I had started to probe children's developing ideas about emotion. Uh, we had largely used a series of interview questions, uh, which gave us a first pass. And I remember telling Henry about the initial results, notably that the youngest children, so they would have been six-year-olds, appeared to have a rather situation-bound conception of emotion. So for them, sadness was what you felt when you'd lost something precious. Fear was what you felt when you encountered something threatening. And I have this memory of Henry gently but confidently suggesting that these young children surely understood, in addition to these situational aspects, something about the mental aspects of emotion as well, notably the beliefs and desires that go into the appraisal of a given situation. And of course, uh, Henry was right. And indeed, some of our later, more experimental studies began to uncover that mental, un those mental underpinnings. So our next um, meeting took place in the early um, 80s, not in Michigan this time, but in Oxford. And here we are, uh, taking a break at a well-known pub just outside the city of Oxford called The Trout, some of you may know it. Um, rather picturesque place beside the river. <clears throat> so just to fill you in about who's present, on the left of the picture you'll see my former advisor, Peter Bryant, and indeed his teenage son, Daniel, um, some dozen years earlier when Daniel was a toddler, um, he had kindly volunteered, or rather he'd been, he had been volunteered, to be one of my very first subjects um, in my doctoral research. So um, he was at that point able to search for hidden objects. In fact, to my frustration, he didn't make the expected A not B error, which is what I wanted to observe. Well, turning to Henry, as you can see, um, he was in a chin-rubbing state of mind when this photograph was taken at the trout, although we don't know exactly why. So let's fast forward uh, two or three years, uh, perhaps a little more, um, uh, to see if we can have some more clues. So this picture was also taken in Oxford, as it happens in a rather handsome building belonging to St. John's, where I worked. And indeed, this building for many years served as a place where circuit judges would stay overnight, so it was known appropriately as the judges' lodgings. And um, at this, uh, in this location, a group of us were discussing in the early days the developing theory of mind. So you'll probably recognize not just Henry, uh, but the other three people in the picture. In the foreground is uh, Heinz Wimmer and Joseph Perner. And in between Joseph and Henry um, is Alan Leslie. Well, as you can see, despite the passage of several years, Henry is still in a chin-rubbing state of mind. And looking at the photograph more carefully, it looks as if this state of mind is contagious because Heinz Wimmer is doing the same thing. 
Now, thinking about what was going on at this meeting, I suspect that what triggered this particular outbreak of thoughtfulness can be captured in one word, or at least one hyphenated word, meta-representation. So the atmosphere at this St. John's meeting was heavy with meta-representation, discussions of it, uh, its status, and in particular, <coughs> um, its uh, timing. So there were pleas for its appearance at 18 months, at four years, at 10 years. Um, by the way, it's worth noting that this particular photo, um, and this speaks to the quality of the photo, is actually a meta-representation in itself. It's a copy of a photo in Joseph's book, Understanding the Representational Mind. And the original picture was taken by John Flavel, who uh, we were fortunate enough to have at this meeting. And I'll come back to John uh, in a moment. Well, I won't detain you with the answer to the question about meta-representation. I want to move on to another more personal aspect of Henry that I that came into view during these visits that he was uh, making um, to Oxford. So on one occasion, Henry and I drove to see my parents some 50 miles away <coughs> in the county of Wiltshire. And it was during this visit that I realized that Henry had a way with older people, including older women. So my mother was completely charmed by this tall American who opened car doors, relished every English scone and piece of fruitcake that was placed in front of him, um, was in all major respects a model visitor. So as the years passed, I had two more occasions to notice and appreciate Henry's thoughtfulness, thoughtfulness towards older colleagues. Um, he remained a trusted support and friend to Harold Stevenson in the years after his retirement. And some of you uh, may remember um, that Henry, it was Henry who organized a splendid celebration of John Flavel's achievements at an SRCD meeting. Uh, John, who was on the brink of retirement, was very moved by the tributes that flowed in on that occasion, I remember. I remember. So during this period, Henry secured some funding from Michigan, which enabled the two of us to remain connected and one happy outcome of that connection was a paper published um, in 1995 on children's understanding of emotion, not as indexed by experimental work or <coughs> by interview questions, but by their natural language, uh, natural language as recorded and archived in the Childers database. So this brings me to a discussion more directly of uh, Henry's achievements. And looking back, I want to dwell on what, for me, was the most influential. Um, in fact, it was not so much his groundbreaking experimental work on the child's theory of mind or his theorizing about the child as a young scientist. Um, I admired those, um, <coughs> uh, those contributions. But the book or the piece of work that influenced me, especially in my own thinking, was the book that he published together with Karen Barsh in 1995 called Children Talk About the Mind. There were two things that impressed me about the book. First, it did on a much bigger canvas what Henry and I had started to do during that same period with respect to children's talk about emotions. So in the book, uh, Karen and Henry showed that natural language can be a window onto the child's mind. It permits potentially universalizable claims about the kinds of concepts and distinctions that they master earlier in development, as well as those that come on board uh, a little bit later. Um, but I think equally important, if not more so, is the fundamental nature of such observational data. And I want to stress that. So. Judging by the amount of experimental data devoted to, for example, the false belief task, one might be forgiven for concluding that three and four-year-olds spend a lot of time thinking about false beliefs, whether it's their own false belief or another person's false belief. On the other hand, data from children's spontaneous talk as analyzed 
in children talk about the mind, shows convincingly, I think, that they actually spend a lot of time thinking and talking about states of desire and also states of knowledge. There is, admittedly, talk about false belief, but it's not center stage. So in my judgment, uh, natural language data, especially when it's carefully analyzed in the way that Henry and Karen were able to do, can give you a sense of the ecology of the child's mind. And I'm borrowing a phrase, a memorable phrase there from Gregory Bateson. Gregory, Gregory Bateson. So the kinds of concepts and distinctions that play a recurrent and even a central role in young children's thinking. So as time has gone on, I've actually become more and more convinced that the best developmental research is based on, on the one hand, the kind of observational richness that is exemplified by that book, Children Talk About the Mind, supplemented um, and reinforced by the type of experimental work that Henry is so well known for. And of course, Henry um, can claim examples in his own published uh, papers of exactly that combination. So let me sum up. Henry, to my mind, is one of those rare developmental psychologists who, in a certain sense, honors the entire lifespan. <clears throat> On the one hand, he's one of the foremost and most sensitive analysts that we have of what young children are saying and thinking. And alongside that, he is someone who respects and honors the wisdom and contribution made by members of the older generation. So thank you, Henry, for your impact on my thinking, and thank you more generally for all that you've contributed to our much beloved field of developmental psychology. It was here. It was here at the University of Michigan. And um, he had come over and was in these RVs with these Dutch students from uh, where it was at the University of the Netherlands. That's what you said at the very beginning. You, you have to tune into his sort of soft voice. You might have missed some of that at the beginning. But um, so they came through here. And this was when um, I still had a uh, office over at the Center for Human Growth and Development as well. and. It was at the, uh, the Center for Human Growth and Development at that time was in a building that had formerly been a, um, a dormitory for medical students, um, single medical students because it was very close to the medical school. And so it just happened to be that in the bathrooms there, there were showers and there were stuff like that. So the first time I ever met Paul, was I came into the office early in the morning, <laughs> and um, he was herding all these naked Dutch students <laughs> out of the out of the building. <laughs> they just all had showers back onto the RVs. <laughs> so, so he left that part out, but I'm not going to leave that. Yeah, he, he should not have left that part out. <laughs> okay, so our next speaker is Jonathan Lane. He is going to be live on Zoom. Um, uh, he will be presenting from Vanderbilt University. He wasn't able to make the trip, but he very much wanted to be here. He's been watching the whole thing uh, on Zoom. And the title of his talk is An Extraordinary Mind, my developmental journey with Henry Wellman. And Dave, you'll set it up? OK, thanks. I 
Dave, Dave, can you give me a, a thumbs up if uh, my audio is okay? All right, great. Got a helicopter flying over my building right now. There it goes. Um, so I'm really honored uh, to be part of this celebration for Henry, and I'm sorry that I couldn't be there in person. Um, but it's it's really great uh, hearing other students and colleagues discuss their work, um, their experiences with Henry. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, for my time is first present some of the work that I ran under Henry's guidance when I was a grad student at Michigan, uh, and then talk about the ways in which Henry's mentorship continues to influence how I conduct science and how I mentor my own students now. So when I came to Michigan in 2006, I had only very rough ideas about what I wanted to study in the realm of theory of mind. I knew I was really interested in theory of mind, but I didn't exactly know what aspect of it I wanted to, to study. So I knew I was interested in how theory of mind interfaces with moral development, how theory of mind plays a role in conceptualizing certain supernatural notions. Um, at the time, almost all the work on theory of mind, uh, I had asked children to reason about ordinary human minds, which made a whole lot of sense because ordinary human minds are the ones that children interact with the most. But children and adults don't exclusively contemplate ordinary minds. Children and adults often entertain ideas about beings with extraordinary mental capacities. So TV shows, movies have characters who are telepathic or super smart. Uh, parents tell their children that Santa knows if they've been naughty or nice. And folks worldwide uh, from different religious traditions believe in an all-knowing God. It seemed like there was this whole universe of minds that the theory of mind literature had largely ignored. An exception was a small body of work, including that very little kids think that everyone is all-knowing. That didn't seem quite right to me. And in speaking more with Henry about this work, um, it, it became clear that this prominent take didn't really fit with what we already knew about children's theory of mind development, language acquisition, um, and it, it also didn't seem particularly socially adaptive. So in that first year of grad school uh, for Henry's cognitive development uh, seminar, we wrote study proposals. And the study that I proposed focused on how children understand extraordinary minds. My initial proposal probably wasn't great. In fact, Henry asked me to rewrite and resubmit the assignment because uh, it didn't read enough like the study proposal. Uh, but Henry encouraged me to pursue this line of work. His encouraging me to pursue this work <clears throat> was remarkable. This wasn't research that Henry had been conducting at this point, he could have steered me in another direction that was more aligned with his ongoing projects, but he didn't do that. He thought it was important for me to pursue my own interests, and that's something that I'm really, really grateful for. Uh, another thing that I'm grateful for is that early on, Henry introduced me to Margaret Evans, also a wonderful mentor uh, with whom Henry and I collaborated on the work that I'll present in just a bit. And I should note that Henry's the one who introduced me to Paul Harris, our previous speaker, uh, and my postdoc mentor. So back to 2006, 2007, uh, we wanted to examine children's earliest understanding of extraordinary minds. So we started with preschoolers, and we used theory of mind tasks, which many of you here are quite familiar with, uh, to examine the knowledge that they attributed to agents with contrasting abilities. So these agents included uh, ordinary humans, a little girl named Mary, God um, and Mr. Smart, uh, Mr. Smart, a novel being who we taught children knows everything. Uh, we'll just trade out that picture of Mr. Smart with a new picture there. And we didn't tell children anything about God. So whatever they knew about God in God's mind was what they brought to the table. In contrast, we taught children about Mr. Smart's mind, describing him as knowing everything and describing how he knows the contents of containers without ever looking inside. So with Mr. Smart, we could standardize the information children receive, and we could see whether that immediate and direct input 
influences how children reason about his mind. So here's an example of one of the theory of mind tasks, false belief tasks. Children were shown a posed crayon box and a paper bag. The interviewer asked children what they thought was inside the box. And both containers were open to reveal the box actually held marbles and that the bag held the crayons. And then both containers were closed. And for each of the agents, in turn, children were asked what the agent will think is inside the box. If children say crayons, they're attributing a false belief to the agent. To get at the role of cultural input uh, in this development, we ran one study with children from relatively secular homes uh, in the Midwest and another with children attending religious school who also frequently attended a place of worship and were more often exposed to media about God. So these graphs here show uh, children's attributions of false belief to the agents with higher numbers meaning that children, more children attributed a false belief to the agent. Age is on the x-axis. Children attending secular schools are on the left. Those attending religious schools are on the right. I'll not provide much statistical detail, but uh, I'll give you the main takeaways from this work. So each line that I'm about to show you uh, represents the false beliefs attributed to a different agent. So we'll start with children's reasoning about an ordinary human, Mary. So consistent with hundreds of other studies, by four years, children in both samples attributed false belief to the ordinary human. They reported that Mary would think that crayons are in the box. What's more interesting is that many four-year-olds, even those who had attended religious schools, these are children who were attending places of worship and who were frequently exposed to ideas about a Judeo-Christian God and God's all-knowingness, these four-year-olds attributed false belief to God as well. So even among religiously schooled children, four-year-olds' intuition was that God possessed a fallible human mind. By five years, children in both samples differentiated between God and the ordinary humans. They reported that God didn't know the actual contents of the box, marbles, while the girl would hold a false belief. And when we turn to the data for Mr. Smart, we see an interesting difference between the secular and religious children. And this was something that we weren't expecting to find. For secular children, it wasn't until five years or so that most reported that Mr. Smart would know the actual contents of the box. In contrast, more religious children did this as early as four years. So this suggests that specific sociocultural input may facilitate an early appreciation for extraordinary mental abilities, but that it may not manifest unless that information is called to the forefront of children's minds, like it was for Mr. Smart. And remember, we didn't tell children anything about God immediately for the false belief tasks. So by about five years, children are demonstrating this impressive flexibility in their theory of mind. They're denying certain knowledge to ordinary humans while attributing that same sort of knowledge to God and to a novel extraordinary being, Mr. Smart. And similar patterns have been found in studies conducted in, uh, by other labs and other cultures. But importantly, even children with heavy religious exposure initially conceptualized God's mind as being fallible, like an ordinary human mind. Progressive development in children's theory of mind, informed by cultural experience, facilitated their understanding of a variety of different types of minds, which is what we might anticipate in the context of theory theory. So while the concepts of these five-year-olds were impressive, they're arguably not yet demonstrating what we think of when we talk about omniscience. Omniscience is more than having just privileged access to certain types of information about the here and now, like the contents of containers. And it's a conception that an agent possesses complete knowledge. Um, knowledge of everything from the past, and knowledge of everything that's going to happen in the future, knowing everyone's unspoken intentions and dreams, and knowing even more than experts. So we conducted some further studies examining how children and adults come to understand the idea of total omniscience. We asked folks about the knowledge held by this character, Ms. Smart, we could have used God here, but participants varied in their knowledge of God. So if we were to find that they didn't understand a certain aspect of God's omniscience, it could just be because they hadn't yet learned about it 
Whereas with NIST Smart, we could teach participants about our extraordinary knowledge and we could standardize that input across participants. We taught participants that she knows all sorts of things that they themselves wouldn't know. So she knows the contents of a new box without having to look in the box. In this case, there was a stapler inside the box. Uh, she knows where the stapler is made, Canada, uh, in this case, and even knows how many staplers are made in Canada each year. And we stress that Ms. Smart knows everything about everything. And we use this hand gesture. She knows everything about everything. And then after this introduction, we asked whether Ms. Smart knows some things, lots of things, or everything, and anyone who said anything other than everything was corrected. So we really made sure to hammer in the fact that Ms. Smart knows everything that she's a mission. And then we asked about the breadth of Ms. Smart's knowledge or the types of knowledge she holds to include knowledge of facts about the present, past, and future, and uh, knowledge about participants and their parents. Um, you don't have to read through this full list of questions, but there are, there are a whole bunch of things that we asked uh, participants about whether Ms. Smart would, would hold that knowledge. So here's the extent to which children attributed each category of knowledge to Ms. Smart. For the sake of time, I want to focus on that bottom row, folks' attributions of all categories of knowledge to Ms. Smart. See, there's a clear developmental trend. Only about a quarter of preschoolers attributed all that knowledge to Ms. Smart, but this increased gradually over childhood. So here we see substantial development uh, in children's attributions of knowledge for being who they just been taught knows everything about everything. We also measured the depth of knowledge that participants attributed to Ms. Smart or the amount of knowledge she holds within a domain, so how much she knows about cars. Uh, cars. First, we introduced participants to experts, a doctor, mechanic, chef, and pilot, describing each of the experts' domains of expertise. So a doctor is a person who helps people when they're sick or hurt, to make sure that people are healthy. And then we pitted Ms. Smart against each expert. We asked eight questions about who holds more knowledge within experts' domains. So who knows more about why you get a tummy ache, a doctor or Ms. Smart? Someone who understands a mission should always report that Ms. Smart knows more. So here are attributions of knowledge to Ms. Smart versus the experts. Um, adults overwhelmingly reported that Ms. Smart knew more than the experts. But preschoolers reported that the experts were more knowledgeable than Ms. Smart. Children about 5 to 11 years performed better, but still not as well as adults. So and understanding of missions seems to be a protracted developmental process, likely facilitated by sociocultural input and probably the development of other cognitive capacities too. So we have data on children's understanding of infinity that correlates with children's performance on these tasks. So this contradicts some popular notions that children simply think that everybody knows everything. That's certainly not the case. And in fact, little kids are probably unable to conceptualize emissions until much later in childhood, potentially um, adolescence or adulthood. So all these studies uh, were part of my dissertation under Henry's and Margaret Evans' uh, mentorship. So here's me with Henry and Margaret just after my dissertation defense. Since then, um, my research has taken different paths, but I continue to be really interested in this question of how children come to understand different sorts of minds. In the years since we ran those studies with Ms. Smart, smart devices have become almost ubiquitous in households across the country. Uh, we can use these devices to access tremendous amounts of information. And for better or worse, when we're plagued with a question, many of us consult Google or ask one of our smart devices. So this got Judith Banovich, her students, and me questioning the extent to which children consider smart devices omniscient. We're using similar uh, paradigms as what we used earlier, but now asking children whether a smart device possesses all these sorts of knowledge and whether that device knows more than experts. So far, we're finding very similar developmental patterns where the children are reasoning about Ms. Smart or a smart device, especially uh, when it comes to the depth of knowledge that children attribute to these devices. Young preschoolers are pretty conservative 
when attributing knowledge to the smart devices, um, and over the course of middle later childhood, attribute comparatively more knowledge to the device to the devices than to the experts. So importantly, we don't have to look to superheroes, deities, or smart devices to get at children's thinking about different sorts of minds. We can look within ordinary humanity and see tons of neurodiversity. So in a few students, my a uh, few studies, my students are finding that uh, once children pass basic knowledge access tasks, they attribute visually derived knowledge similarly to persons with and without auditory or perceptual or rather physical disabilities. Um, and children by about five years onward are more lenient towards persons who commit moral or conventional violations if their behaviors were a product of their disabilities. Children interpret these behaviors as being less driven by negative intent. So work along these lines has implications, I think, not just for understanding the flexibility of children's theory of mind, um, children's understanding of disabilities and the psychological implications of disability might influence how children interact with people uh, who have disabilities or how they reason about the rights of people with disabilities, whether they should be given a certain accommodations. Uh, and we're starting to look into these sorts of questions now. So I think it's clear that Henry's thinking, Henry's mentorship has had an enduring effect on my research program, and it certainly had a tremendous positive effect on my thinking and my writing. Uh, I'd like to briefly mention some other ways in which Henry's mentorship has had lasting effects for me um, and my approach to science and, and how I mentor my own students. So throughout grad school and still now on occasion, uh, I'll question whether uh, my work is important enough or if it's interesting enough. And whenever I asked Henry these questions in grad school, he reassured me that if, if I find the work interesting and if the science is done well, then it's worth doing. Throughout my career, uh, this wisdom has guided me and offered reassurance. So when my students come to me with similar questions, similar doubts, I give them the same advice that Henry gave me. I have little artifacts of Henry's in my office now, things that uh, he gave me years ago when he was starting to declutter his lab space, things that uh, my students are probably perplexed by when they see them on my bookshelves. So here's an old timey tin band-aid box that use, was used in a bunch of uh, theory of mind studies and an old rock sponge used in uh, appearance reality tasks. Usually these artifacts, they just sit there. I don't bring them to students' attention. Uh, but there's another set of artifacts that I purposely point out to students. They're samples of the substantial handwritten feedback that Henry gave me on drafts of manuscripts, often appended with pages of notes rolled on yellow lined paper. Um, early in grad school, this feedback, these yellow sheets were a bit daunting to me. Uh, at least at first, I, I just figured, wow, I'm, I'm so far away from this paper being good enough. But Henry's feedback was always so helpful, so thoughtful, and included just the right amount of encouragement for me to press on with the next draft. So now I return drafts of papers to my students with tons of my notes strewn throughout. And to soften the blow, I show my students these yellow sheets from Henry uh, to show them that it's all part of the process. So thank you, Henry. Thank you for mentoring me throughout the process and for being someone who, uh, to this day, I feel I can rely on as a mentor and as a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. That was really a beautiful talk. Um, I don't know if you could hear, but the audience was very appreciative too. A lot of clapping. <laughs> so thank you. And we're, people are waving and I think we're, <laughs> you probably can't see, but, um, uh,
I guess, did you want to take a question or two before we go to break or? Sure. Okay. So. I see there's a question in the back too, Ann. Is it? All right, Jonathan, I assume you can't see. It's Twyla. Hi, Twyla. Good to see you. Um, so I want to know about dogs. Where are you on dogs these days? Oh gosh, I'd love to be studying dogs. Kids' understanding of dogs or, or studying dogs' cognition? <laughs> Study of dogs' cognition. I remember that paragraph you made us put in there about dogs' cognition, and I thought it was so cool, and I've been thinking about it ever since. So have you followed up? Uh, unfortunately, I had. Well, so I, I ended up writing a theory piece on uh, temperament and uh, theory of mind where we brought in all this. So Twilight's question has to do with this domestication study that was conducted in Siberia decades ago where they selected dogs based on certain temperaments or selected uh, foxes actually based on certain temperaments and those foxes over the course of many generations uh, indeed tended to have the sort of temperament that they were selecting for, which is a more tame temperament, less aggressive, more socially interested. And it turns out that this is potentially a sort of temperament that's really conducive to social cognitive development, being uh, more reserved, reflective, non-aggressive towards one another, uh, perhaps facilitates social interaction. Certainly it facilitates social inter interaction by virtue of that, facilitates social cognition. And so um, Lindsay Bowman and I pulled together a bunch of uh, the work on temperament and theory of mind and a couple of years ago published a uh, paper in developmental review kind of outlining these relations between temperament and theory of mind. And the only paper that I've written about dogs um, is a paper that's never been cited. It took so long to write and it went through so many uh, revisions and so many rejections. And it's, and I'm questioning kind of the conclusions that those Siberian researchers came to and that have been taken for granted for decades, uh, conclusions about you know, why certain dogs seem to have uh, so uh, certain dispositions that were also correlated with their cuteness. Won't go into a lot of detail now, but that's that's the only dog thing I've had a chance to write, but I'd love to one day do some actual research with dogs. Thank you, and Jonathan. I'd love to see it too. Thanks. Are there one last question, Dave Utah. Oh wait, no, you need to be on the mic, sorry, so that they, so everybody can hear. Yes, you can patiently wait. <laughs> After all that, it's, it's actually a very boring question, but if you could make those, uh, if you could actually like physically copy those pages, I think the whole future graduate students, the yellow pages that you showed, like, I mean, I've told similar stories, but no one can believe it. And <laughs> if you actually have the physical pages, I really think, you know, you joked about it. Please, <laughs> right there. Please scan. If you could scan it and put it online somewhere, that would really help future generations. If I if I have Henry's consent, I will I will do that. Uh, this is Henry. Carolyn. Do you give your consent? Okay, he said yes. Yeah, this is Carolyn Schultz. I just want to say, um, a couple of grad students from my era bought Henry a pencil sharpener so we could actually read his comments. <laughs> so everyone after me deserves. Uh, yeah, we're the ones. It took who a little while to learn how to decode. Yeah, he kept Dixon and Ty Ticonderoga in business. Okay, unfortunately, we're going to have to end it here. But thank you so much, John. Thank you. Okay, so we're, we're uh, time for a quick break. Let's um, maybe like a five minute break and then we'll come back. Our next, speak our next speaker is Marjorie Rhodes who will be speaking on integrating intuitive psychology and intuitive sociology.
Okay, hi. Um, thank you so much uh, to Susan um, for inviting me to be part of the symposium. I'm really delighted to be back at Michigan and really honored to um, think about Henry's contributions to the field and this department and uh, my own research career. Like many of the other speakers, I wanted to start by thinking about uh, the exciting day when I met Henry, but I don't actually remember it <laughs> because uh, much like Susan, I met Henry in the early 80s. Oh, when I, yeah. Uh, <laughs> when I looked like this. So that's me in the uh, blue flower dress there. And um, I, didn't, I don't have a picture of, of me and Henry from that time, but that is the approximate age and approximate location uh, when I first met Henry. I'm there in front of my childhood home on Linwood Street, which happened to be just two doors down from Henry and his family. Um, so that's when I first met Henry. It does look like, you know, that in particular was a very exciting day. Um, I also just wanted to share uh, this picture taken many years later, um, but not far away at all, just a couple blocks away of Henry meeting my first child, Isaac, um, kind of in the spirit of what Kristen was talking about, of how Henry is such a supportive person, both in the development of our research careers, our professional careers, and just personally um, as we develop through life. Um, as you've heard from everybody today, Henry is an incredibly supportive mentor who has a lifelong impact on all of his students, even those that he did not meet in toddlerhood. Um, but I was exceptionally lucky in that way and that I've gotten, I've known Henry um, for my whole life. However, I really got to know Henry once I started as a graduate student at Michigan. And uh, when I first came to graduate school, uh, I really did not know at first what I wanted to study at all. Um, and so there was a bit of exploration there. Sometime uh, towards the start of my second year, I became interested in the development of social cognition and Susan and I were doing studies on the development of social categorization. And I thought, well, if I'm interested in the development of social cognition, I should go and talk to Henry. Um, I think he studied something about that, I think is really the extent to what I knew what I was doing. And so I um, made a meeting with Henry with really no particular idea of what we were going to talk about or any particular studies I would want to do, but just kind of let's chat and maybe there's something that we could work on together. So my memory is um, that I went and we had a meeting and we chatted a little bit and Henry said, I do have an idea of a project that, that we could work on together. And um, something about almost 10 years later, <laughs> we then had this paper <laughs> that came out of that project. I'm not going to tell you about really the research in this paper. Um, that's not what I'm going to focus on in the research part of my talk. But I wanted to tell you about this project a little bit because of what I think it shows to me about Henry as a mentor and as a scientist. So this project, now that I've been a professor myself for a little while and I've mentored some students for a little while, I think was actually kind of an outrageous thing to suggest to a second year graduate student because it was a very, very big undertaking. So in this project, we wanted to find a bunch of three and four year old children who had just the right conceptual level of almost understanding false belief. So they couldn't yet pass those false belief tasks with like the crayons hidden in the band-aids like box that you've heard about today. But they also couldn't be really far from understanding that. They had to be almost there conceptually. Okay, so we, I went out and screened a bunch of kids on the theory of mind scale that Henry and David Liu created uh, in order to find children who almost understood false belief. Then I visited the, this sample of children at their preschool twice a week for six weeks and did this very elaborate scripted training experience where we provided these children with lots of examples of what we thought was exactly the right kind of human behavior that we described in stories that would give them a lot of evidence about what people do and allow them to have this missing insight that they had into the nature of false beliefs and how they motivated behavior. 
So this was very time intensive work with each children. So it's not like I could run the whole batch through in one six week period. I could only really work with a few at a time, given that I was also taking classes and TAing and working on other projects and so on. So I ran six week batches after six week batches with screening children to find just the right level of conceptual understanding in between for pretty much all of graduate school. <laughs> um, and um, so, so, and then in the end we had, we had this paper, which was really interesting. And, but the, so, so looking back, I think that was a very big undertaking for a second year graduate student and also a big responsibility for a mentor to place in a student who um, Henry hadn't worked with before. But it didn't feel outrageous or like too much at the time at all. And what I think having done this shows to me about Henry as a mentor, what, why it felt doable was that Henry has these really high expectations and beliefs that his students can go and do incredible things and will do incredible science with him. And I think that gave all of us as his students the confidence to then go and learn whatever we had to do to go and do something incredible. So it didn't feel like too much at all. It felt like an amazing opportunity, which it was. As a scientist, what I think this really illustrates about Henry is how he always goes for whatever method is needed to answer the question, no matter how challenging it might be. So um, I made a little list here. I don't know if I can actually scroll through because I knew I would forget some of them. But Henry has used you know, the kinds of experimental work with children we've heard about, natural language an um, analyses, developmental cognitive neuroscience, uh, computational modeling, longitudinal work, cross-cultural work, work with special populations of children, all in the service of answering the fundamental things he wants to know about the development of social cognition. So for Henry, you always have to go out and learn whatever method you need to answer your question and also Doing that, he, I always felt from Henry that we should dream big about the kinds of studies we can do in cognitive development. We shouldn't see ourselves as limited by you know, what is easy or what has been done before. And I've really tried to uh, take that message to heart in my own work. And I'm really grateful to have had this experience towards the beginning of graduate school um, where I learned that from Henry. The other thing um, that I learned about, about Henry as a scientist from working on this project is that he's always really emphasize the importance of studying development directly. So, so much of cognitive development research, we often look at snapshots of children at different ages. What do they think at these different ages? What can they do at these different ages? Um, but Henry's always pushed the field to do more than that and look directly at the process of development as it unfolds, as we could do with this kind of training experiment that we did. And so I think that's a really um, incredible message for the field to focus on and something I've also uh, tried to focus on in my own research. Okay, so the research I want to tell you about today is about interrelations between intuitive psychology and intuitive sociology. Uh, as we've heard today, Henry's work has been foundational to the field's understanding of how intuitive psychology develops. So as you've heard, intuitive psychology is a naive theory that people rely on to explain human behavior by appeal to intrinsic, uh, things intrinsic to the child, non obvious things intrinsic to the person, things like their beliefs, their desires, their traits, and so on. So, if you were going to predict, for example, you know, which, which box is this child going to go to? Is the child going to want to do an activity about art or about science? If you're thinking about intuitive psychology, you're going to think about what you know about her mental states. Does she like art or science? Does she believe the boxes actually contain uh, what they depict or something else? Um, maybe does she feel good at art and science and so on? I've always been interested in the somewhat adjacent question of intuitive uh, sociology, which is an intuitive theory about the structure of society and how that influences human behavior and human social interactions. So this includes things like uh, what are the groups that make up society? How do those groups come to be? What do those groups determine about their members? How do those groups relate to one another? So in this case, there's lots of in sociological explanations that you could appeal to as well to predict what this child is going to do. Um, maybe you think she'll avoid science because she's a girl. A person might believe that girls are intrinsically less interested or less capable in science and so will avoid it. A person could believe that boys usually do science and so she would avoid the science box in order to conform to those normative expectations. A person could believe that girls are often structurally disadvantaged in science and so maybe then therefore become less skilled at it and would start to avoid science over time. So a child trying to, or an adult trying to predict this person's behavior could think about all of those causal mechanisms that extend outside the individual as well. Um, and so, if 
sorry. Let's just okay, one sec. <laughs> okay. So intuitive sociological theories can also be used in a similar manner as intuitive psychology to predict behavior, but they appeal to these kinds of um, external the, these kinds of causal mechanisms that extend beyond the individual. My thinking about how these intuitive theories develop and relate to one another grew out of conversations that I had with Henry during graduate school. Of course, sometimes these two intuitive theories are going to be complementary. So you might think she's going to pick the art box, both because she's a girl and girls usually do art, and because you happen to know that she as an individual really likes art. Uh, sometimes they're going to be conflicting, so you might think, uh, I happen to know she really likes science, but girls usually choose the art box, and then how you're going to decide what you think she's going to do is just going to depend on how you weight those two considerations at any point in time. Um, um, but beyond operating separately in that kind of manner as sort of two separate sources of information about why people do what they do, these theories can also interact with one another in kind of more meaningful ways. They can constrain one another. So sometimes the mental states that you think a person has depends on information about the social structure in which they are embedded. And then they can serve as parallel and interactive sources of developmental change. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some research that uh, shows these later more interactive uh, relationships today. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about how intuitive sociology can provide a constraint on how children use their intuitive psychology. So how children infer the mental states of other people by thinking about the social structure in which they're embedded. And then I'll go in the other direction um, and talk about how intuitive psychology facilitates the development of intuitive sociology, which is really about how children learn the structure of the social world by thinking about the mental states of other people. And I'm just going to give some very quick examples of these things without going into too much detail. OK, so moral cognition is a great example where we can see the interaction between beliefs about mental states and about social structure. So if you imagine a child stealing the cookie of his hungry classmate here, it's straightforward to judge that this kid is probably doing something morally questionable, but your assumptions about his mental states really matter in that. So you think he's doing something morally questionable if you assume he knows that this cookie belongs to his classmate, we, he's stealing it on purpose, um, then we can think, you know, he's doing something morally bad. And if he does that kind of thing a lot, maybe he's like not a really very nice kid and needs some intervention here. But if his mental states were different, so say he didn't know that each kid was just supposed to eat the cookie on their own plate, maybe he thinks it's a total free-for-all, um, then, you know, we might, or he's mistaken, he thinks that's his plate, I mean, who knows, then even if the outcome is the same, he takes his friend's cookie, we don't attribute the same moral status uh, to the behavior that he did, and, and we might not think it reflects on his underlying personality traits. So that just shows the role of our mental state reasoning in moral judgment. But there are also lots of ways in which the social structure and social relationships in which these kids are embedded can change our evaluation of the situation and even our attribution of mental states to the agent. So for example, maybe these guys are part of different groups and the two groups are engaged in a kind of ongoing battle of stealing cookies from one another all week long. In that case, we still might not think that this is a great situation to have happening in the classroom, but in this case, the agent's behavior might reflect less on him as an individual and more about his role in the group and the group's relations to one another. So just in some empirical work I did soon after leaving Michigan and building on these ideas, we found that young kids do indeed consider these types of social structures and group memberships to evaluate the moral status and personal attributes of individual agents. So this work was very straightforward. We just showed children stories, like I just told you, where one child did something objectionable, like stole a cookie to another child, and they were either from the same group um, or from two different groups. And we just asked them to explain why did he do what he did. So again, in this study, children are just asked, why did the agent do something, like steal the cookie or hit another kid on the playground? And all I want to point out here is that they more often said, oh, he stole it because he's mean, or because uh, he was feeling really angry at him, or something that really reflects the agent's mental states or personality dispositions. They did that when the, when the guy stole from a member of his own group. So when a red guy stole from a red guy, well, that's because he's like a pretty mean guy. 
But if it was a red guy stealing from a blue guy, they were less likely to think it reflected on the red guy as a person and more likely to appeal to these other things. Well, he did it because they're members of different groups. All of a sudden, that just becomes the explanation for why he did this mean thing, or because they're enemies with one another, which was definitely not told to them in the story. So that's something that they're inferring there. OK, so I just wanted to show that quick example of how intuitive sociology, the social structure um, that children are reasoning about, can constrain how they use their intuitive psychology. Uh, so in that case, children infer the mental states of the agent by reasoning about the social structure in which they're embedded. So Henry and I uh, developed from that empirical work and other similar studies, a framework for thinking about understanding developmental change and moral cognition based on thinking about how, how we make moral judgments is going to depend across development on developmental changes in our intuitive psychology and in our intuitive sociology and in how children weight those two things across development. So this was something we continued to work on together um, after I left graduate school. So next, I just briefly want to tell you about the other direction here, how children learn the structure of the social world by reasoning about the mental states of other people. This is a line of work that um, we've been doing more recently in my lab, uh, but was very much inspired by everything we as a field have learned about social cognition from Henry. So part of why I'm including this is to show how fundamental Henry's insights about social, social cognition are to understanding many aspects of child development, you know, beyond theory of mind and, and directly intuitive psychology. Also, eventually, where we went with this work methodologically was very much inspired by the lessons I learned from Henry that I talked about at the beginning about thinking big about the kinds of studies we can do in developmental science. So the starting point here uh, for this example I want to share with you is that a key part of intuitive sociology is realizing which of the many ways that people differ from one another reflect meaningful social categories in one's community. And we know from other work in this department, um, from Susan's lab, that a key way that children learn uh, which categories are important is by listening to language, especially generic claims like boys love trucks. So children assume Children assume that categories they hear described with these kinds of generic claims reflect categories that are inductively informative, even beyond what's described, and are stable um, across contexts um, and across time. But exactly in thinking about how language does this, it isn't always totally straightforward why that's the case. There's nothing in the statement, boys love trucks, that communicates directly that boys have other things in common with one another or that boy itself is a stable, uh, is a stable kind of category. But empirically, children do develop those kinds of beliefs about categories they hear described with generics. So I think they do that in part because of what these statements signal about the mental states of the speakers. Uh, and in this way, children learn the important social categories in their environment from reasoning about how the language they hear about categories reflects the mental states of other people. So I'll just briefly show you some of the reasons why we think that's the case, that this isn't really about direct interpretation of language all the time, but about what the language is signaling about the speaker's mental states. So I'll explain this in the context of a recent experiment um, that we did. So here we introduced kids to two made-up groups of people, Zarpies and Gorps, and they heard a generic description about one of the Gorps, like, about one of the groups like this. Like, uh, look at this Zarpy from the yellow group. Zarpies are good at painting pictures. Okay. Then they're shown another Zarpy, and they're asked, do you think this other Zarpy is good at painting pictures? To which they should definitely say yes, because they just heard Zarpies are good at painting pictures. But interestingly, then they're shown a member of the other group, the group that wasn't mentioned at all, and they're asked, what about this Gorp? Do you think this Gorp is good at painting pictures? They haven't heard anything about Gorps at all. So just based on the content of the language, they shouldn't have any particular opinion about gorps. They maybe think gorps are great at painting pictures because maybe kids think everyone is good at painting pictures. Or maybe they're 50-50. You haven't told me anything about gorps, so how could I possibly know? But what we think children do often is something a little bit more complicated than that, which is they reason about why did the speaker say zarpies are good at painting pictures. Well, the speaker, if the speaker is knowledgeable about zarpies and gorps and could have said Zarpies and Gorps are good at painting pictures, or kids are good at painting pictures, or Johnny is good at painting pictures, or whatever, and chose to say Zarpies are good, then that suggests that what the speaker really meant, what the speaker really thinks is Zarpies are good and, and Gorps are not. They just didn't say that second part. 
And so with that kind of mental state reasoning feeding into their interpretation of the sentence, children should actually have a pretty reliable expectation about GORPS, which is that even though they didn't hear anything about them, they're not very good at this. And so that's what some of these data show. So the yellow line is the number of times they, or the proportion of times they said, yes, Zarpies are good at painting pictures after they just heard Zarpies are good at painting pictures. So they mostly said yes to that. But about, by about age four and a half and strengthening across childhood, they also said no. Even though you didn't tell me anything about GORPS, no, I don't think GORPS are good at this. Of course, if this is really about their mental state reasoning, then, then who the speaker is should matter a lot. And so we also ran some follow-up studies uh, where we manipulated the speaker's knowledge. So all this makes sense if you think the speaker knows what they're talking about and then chose their words on purpose. But if the speaker is not really that knowledgeable about Zarpies and Gorps, then it doesn't really make sense to draw any conclusions about what they chose to say and what they chose not to say. And children are sensitive to that as well. So when all the same language is given, but by a speaker who doesn't have the same knowledge, doesn't come from the same position of knowledge about Zarpies and Gorps, then, then the children's inferences about the group they left out you know, break down. They go back to sort of a chance level responding. Maybe they're good at it, maybe they're not. So I included this example to show how children learn about social groups from language, how that depends on what they think the language uh, signals about the speaker's mental states, and so really relies on a pretty complicated um, belief-based reasoning on the part of the child. One key implication of this is that sometimes speaker's language is going to influence children's beliefs in ways that the speakers don't anticipate or intend. Because the child reasoning about what motivated you to say that, not just the content of what they are hearing. And so sometimes children are going to draw inferences that are not, um, are not what the speaker intended or thought they were going to do. And so that's another thing that we've been really interested in in the lab. And so here's a quote from a pre-kindergarten teacher talking about science with her class. She said, scientists have a really cool job. They think about something, and they create a smart, a smart thought. So that, that's from an actual pre-kindergarten teacher in New York City teaching a science, science lesson. And you might think this sounds like perfectly nice and inclusive. It's a nice complimentary uh, description of scientists. And maybe kids are going to say, like, that sounds awesome. I want to think cool thoughts. I'm going to be a scientist too. Or maybe you think a preschool is not going <laughs> to care about that. So maybe it would be kind of neutral. But we actually had this kind of initially counterintuitive hypothesis about this, which is that because this is of that generic form, that even though the teacher is saying something positive about scientists, they're also implying that scientists are a distinct kind of person because they're making these abstract generalizations about scientists. And that if children heard a lot of those claims, a lot of generic descriptions of scientists in their sort of everyday science education in pre-K, it could actually backfire by leading them to think only special and distinct kinds of people can succeed in science. So we did a bunch of lab experiments first to see if that was the case, where we manipulated the language that children heard about science. And we did uh, indeed find that to be the case, that when children heard a lot of the generic descriptions of scientists, that it sort of implies being a scientist requires a special identity. Uh, children were quicker to disengage uh, when they encountered setbacks while doing challenging science activities. On the other hand, a sort of more action-oriented focus on science, let's do science instead of we need to be a scientist, um, was, more motivating to, was more motivating to uh, more populations of children. But what I really wanted to know, we, what we wanted to know next after these lab experiments, and this is the, the last thing I'm going to tell you about, is if this language really mattered enough to shape development as it was happening in children. Because it's you know, really one thing to say, OK, I have my child in this lab here. Everything else is silent. I'm going to say this one thing about science, and I'm going to immediately test what they do and how they react. But of course, child development is happening in much messier and noisier contexts where the effects of language have to extend across time. And who knows what children are actually paying attention to at any given moment. And so we would really need to know if this language actually matters in development, both for its practical consequences, but also in trying to actually understand development as it's happening in children's daily lives, we have to test it in a more real world environment. So to do that in a way that we thought would be compelling and still allow us to draw causal conclusions, 
we realized we had to do like a really big field experiment where we would randomly assign teachers uh, to get certain kinds of language training. Um, and it had to be really big because if you're randomly assigning on the, on the level of classroom teachers, you need a lot of classrooms uh, in order to have a sufficiently powered study. Um, and then we were going to have to train teachers, and then we were going to have to actually measure science behavior in classrooms, and that sounded really daunting. But as I told you at the beginning, one of the first lessons I learned from Henry in graduate school was the, like not to be scared of what sounds daunting. Just figure out what method is going to be really compelling, and then you know dream big and go, and go and do that. And so we went and did this really big field experiment, which I won't tell you about the details of, but these were all the pre-K centers across New York City and the um, pre-K for all program there. We ended up with 150 pre-K classrooms and almost 2,000 um, pre-kindergarten children in our experiment. Um, and we randomly assigned teachers to different training experiences, audio recorded their language in the classrooms, and measured science behavior in the rooms a few days later. It was a big project, um, and it ended up being a really compelling demonstration that, in fact, this language, uh, first of all, is modifiable. So um, it is something that teachers can change uh, with actually relatively brief training, and that when you change the language children hear, it does, in fact, change you know, what they do in their, in their actual classroom context. So again, I think this project shows that important lesson that I learned from Henry. I couldn't find the best like ending picture, so I went with the collage approach instead. And in addition to including some pictures of, of Henry with students, I also included the, the yay Michigan pictures of cute children. Um, <laughs> and that's because um, I wanted to conclude by saying that in addition to all of Henry's contributions to the field and to his students through his amazing mentorship, it also stood out to me as I was thinking about coming back here and giving this talk how big of a role Henry has played in this department uh, in making it such a wonderful place to go to graduate school and Michigan such a special place for training in developmental science. So thank you to Henry and thank you to all for the opportunity to come back and visit and reflect on Henry's amazing contributions to the field. Thank you so much for that really wonderful talk. Um, our last speaker before the closing remarks well, is Alison Gopnik, um, and her talk is Theories, Minds, and Henry, How Henry Wellman Transformed Cognitive, Social, and Developmental Psychology. Can everyone hear? Is that working? OK, great. Well, as always, I realize I am the speaker who stands between you and dinner, which is always a terrible position to be in. <laughs> but uh, let me start out by thanking Susan especially so much for putting together such a, a wonderful, such a wonderful day. Um, and thank you all so much. Uh, thank you all so much for coming, facing traveling again in the world. Um, let me also start out with a bit of a uh, confession characteristic, which is that I am terrible at pictures. So there's going to be no beautiful pictures at all. Words, yes, words, good. And there are thousands of words between Henry and me in my email, but lousy at pictures. Um, but when I was going to prepare this talk, I realized that I found a picture that I think uh, as they say, is worth a thousand words. And this actually comes from um, the Google Ngram viewer. So this is the Google Ngram for the phrase theory of mind. And what you can see is that for a very long time, starting in about 1800, um, people kind of said theory of mind more or less a little bit, and about the same little bit from 1800, all the way until that point over there. 
And then suddenly there was this enormous explosion. And I mean, Google doesn't lie, right? As we heard before from Jonathan. Um, suddenly there was this enormous explosion in the number of times that, uh, that theory of mind got used. So theory of mind went from just sort of being a phrase to being a keyword, being one of the words that you put in when you're submitting your paper to SRCD. It became a thing. It became a whole theme in psychology. And I think importantly, it wasn't just that it happened in developmental psychology. Nowadays, it's a theme in social, uh, social psychology, in cross-cultural psychology, uh, in neuroscience, um, as, as we'll see. So this idea suddenly became an idea that was all over the place. Um, and you could ask the question about what happened to make this idea go from something that people just talked about casually to an idea that was really central to many, many fields of psychology. Um, OK, so I met Henry in 1985 at the Society for Research and Child Development. And my meeting Henry exciting day story will sound a bit like Marx maybe more than anybody else's. We were on an escalator. And it turned out that Henry had actually read what was at that point the only paper that I had written. I was a new graduate student and postdoc. And he liked it, too. And he went to tell me that he liked the paper. And I was so intimidated by the fact that Henry, who at that point was already a famous tenured faculty member, and who was also so goddamn tall, um, <laughs> was, was wanted to talk to me about this paper that I froze up and couldn't think of anything to say. And I think Henry thought that I had snubbed him. And then I was terrified of talking to him because I was afraid that I had snubbed him. Um, but fortunately, at about that time, we met again in 1986. And we met at one of the very first Theory of Mind conferences, possibly the first. In fact, I think it was the first Theory of Mind conference. And this is part of what I want to do in this talk is to give, as the elder here, I realize with horror and shock, I want to give some wise advice to the young people. Um, so how did this come about? It came about because Janet Astington was a graduate student then. I was a, just a new postdoc. And we started reading this stuff about kids and their understanding of mind and people and what they thought about minds. And we realized that there were two things we could do. One thing we could do is we could sit down and we could read all these papers, which would take a long time and be really boring. The other thing that we could do is we could get everybody to be in one place, and then they could tell us about all the stuff that they were doing, and we could have a good time, and we could go out dancing, and we could eat lots of food. And that seemed like a much better option at the time. Um, so we organized this workshop. Now, again, this is a graduate student and a postdoc. We had no money. I mean, literally, no money, no funding. Um, what we did was wrote to everybody who we thought was sort of, kind of, somehow doing stuff that felt like it fit this general category. And we said that they could stay in the dorms if they paid for the amount of money that it took to stay in the dorms. That was our, that was our offer um, and come to our conference for two days. Um, and the amazing thing was that every single person that we invited showed up, every single one without exception. In fact, we were a bit shocked because we had to find more dorm rooms. Um, and it turned out that the reason was that all of them were facing this dilemma of I could read all of these papers that are in this area, or I could come and have a good time and talk to all the people. And they rather they decided they would rather come to Toronto. And in parallel, Paul Harris, who you just saw, was arranging a very similar conference in uh, in Oxford. So of course, when we were putting together the people that we wanted to bring to this conference, literally the first person that we thought of was Henry, because at that point Henry was someone who had done more work on what was then metacognition, meta-memory ideas about how children understood what was going on in other people's heads and minds. And of course, we knew the very high quality of the work that Henry did. So he was, he was the first person on our list. And very much to our, uh, our pleasure, he showed, up at the, um, he showed up at this meeting. Um, and it was one of the best intellectual events in my life. And it was a wonderful, wonderful meeting. Suddenly, it turned out that all these people who thought they were just doing weird little stuff around the edges were really doing the same thing. But importantly, it was not yet called anything about theory of mind. Theory of mind wasn't the phrase that appeared. And what happened was that we put together 
Uh, we put together an edited volume. This is another little piece of advice for, uh, for students. We, we put together this edited volume, and, uh, and Janet and Paul asked me if I wanted to be an editor. And a very serious, grave person at the time said to me, look, you do not want to be an editor of an edited volume when you're a postdoc and you're going out and trying to find a job. Because edited volumes, the a and this turns out to be true, the average citation rate for an edited volume is close to zero. It's somewhere between zero and one, but closer to zero than to one. This is not a, not a device, not a thing that you should do. Well, as it turned out, except for this edited volume, which has <laughs> 2,000 citations, uh, has 2,000 citations in Google. So I, the moral is do not take advice from people about what you should do to get a job or succeed. Um, just do what you want to do. Um, uh, so we, we put, together this, uh, put together this edited volume, and as a, literally, as a joke, it says this in the introduction to the, to the, uh, to the volume, we thought developing theories of mind would be a nice title because it was about us developing these theories that we didn't know about yet, and but was also about how children were developing theories. Um, okay, so so that's the how Henry and I met story, and Henry came to this marvelous uh, uh, conference and made did one of the central contributions to this book. Um, so again, getting back to pictures. All right, so maybe 1985 was when the change happened in theory of mind, right? Like maybe it was just Henry and I met and that just influenced, you know, to go back to the things that Jonathan was talking about, it was just a change in the fabric of the universe, the karmic fabric of the universe, and that led to, uh, that led to the increase in theory of mind, which I, I would kind of like to have as an idea, and you can see there's 1985. <laughs> but sadly, I think the actual empirical truth is that the real shift in that uh, curve is in 1990. That's when you can actually see it. And I'm sure the serious statisticians in the audience here will, in, will agree with that view. And what happened in 1999 was this. So not only in 1999 was there the first, Henry's first book about this, but it was called The Child's Theory of Mind. So that idea, which then as you could see in that original engram chart, would come to dominate large chunks of psychology. The first time that it was really articulated at this book length, in this book length way, was in Henry's uh, book, which itself is cited, as someone mentioned, like 4,000 uh, 4, times. So it was Henry's book that really established the idea of theory of mind as a, a general field. And this was to be the first in really a great trilogy of books of Henry's books about theory of mind, and I'll talk about some of the rest of the books in that trilogy. Maybe not, not quite Lord of the Rings, but sort of that general, sort of that general category. This was the Fellowship of the Ring, um, and in that book and in the work that appeared afterwards, uh, again, this is 1990. Henry actually established this as a field. But I want to emphasize something else, which is that, as Marjorie said, and as a number of other people here have said, um, one of the things that's amazing about Henry is, you know, there's this old distinction in the field between the hedgehogs and the foxes. So the hedgehog, it's Isaiah Berlin, the hedgehog knows one thing. Uh, so, sorry, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one thing, but it's a big one. And he, he argued that you could discriminate, you could turn describe people as hedgehogs or foxes, intellectuals. And Henry has really been a conceptual hedgehog. I mean, theory of mind was the thing that he got really interested in back in the 80s, even before it had a name. And, and then he's just done fantastic, wonderful work about that to his most recent work that I'll just talk about briefly. But he's been a methodological fox of a sort that I don't know of anybody else in, I don't know anybody else in psychology who has who has been as foxy as, uh, as Henry has when it comes to methodology, um, covering everything. And you know, again, what we all sort of get trained to do when we have the instinct to do is you know, find something that we can do well and then do it over and over and over again. And Henry very quickly found things that he could do very well that were extremely influential, like doing these laboratory tasks, 
false belief and the difference between the mental and the physical and so forth. But very quickly, what he did was use completely different kinds of methods to do this. One of my favorites, as Paul said, is the work that he did in the uh, Children Talk About the Mind book, where he segued to something completely different, namely uh, spontaneous language, and looked at the spontaneous language that children were producing and figured out incredibly elegant ways to analyze that language in ways that made you understand what was going on in children's minds and their changes in a way that we could never have understood if we just looked in the lab. Um, and what I'm going to do is give some other examples of that kind of foxy methodology that Henry's been involved in. Um, so not only did he do that, he went out and looked at infants, uh, which, as someone was mentioning maybe, uh, Jackie was mentioning, is you know bravery beyond compare to actually move to doing work with infants. And he, um, and he did work on the brain. Uh, he actually was one of the first people to do neuroscience. This is actually a, a paper, uh, a slide from a 2019 uh, paper about uh, social cognitive neuroscience, as it's now called. Um, and in social cognitive neuroscience, it's just taken for granted that what you're studying is theory of mind. You're studying the neural bases of theory of mind. Um, and I can tell you, I was giving a talk recently, and a smart young social neuroscientist came up to me afterwards and said, you know, there's this idea that we have in neuroscience that's called theory of mind. <laughs> and, and I think it might be quite relevant to some of the things that you're talking about, so perhaps you should try reading some of this theory of mind neuroscience, you know, this theory of mind literature, this thing we've discovered in social neuroscience. Um, uh, so this is, this is 2019, and there's a whole large literature about understanding theory of mind. But as fortunately we already heard today from Mark, um, Henry was one of the first people to do this before any of the neuroscientists had gotten to it. Um, and that's the, I'm, I'm grateful that people have already kind of answered some of these, answered some of these, uh, uh, pointed out some of the things that I can only just briefly mention, like these um, neural, uh, this neural, cor neural, neural correlate work. Um, another thing that's been a big, development in developmental uh, psychology is, uh, is, is cross-cultural work, work. And as you might know, in 2010, Joe Henrich uh, got famous with an article about how we should stop just looking at the weird, the Western educated, rich industrial, rich democratic countries, and we needed to look at, we had to look beyond the weird, we had to look at different groups. And again, Henry was there before anybody else. So Henry, from the very beginning of his work, as a number of people mentioned, was doing work in cross-cultural psychology, was going beyond just looking at the convenient samples and doing the very hard work that you had to do to be able to, uh, to, be able to look, behind, look beyond um, and look at different kinds of cultures and indeed different groups. So that Henry did incredibly important work looking at deafness, for example. Um, uh, looking at different kinds of populations and looking at theory of mind and understanding theory of mind in terms of those different kinds of populations. Um, in, the work that, um, in the work that Marjorie talked about, um, Henry has gone beyond just thinking about theory of mind in terms of simple things like belief and desire and talked about social, social sociology and social groups. And again, that's been one of the biggest developments in developmental psychology and indeed in psychology in general. Um, so especially from this methodological perspective, not only did Henry introduce the idea of theory of mind to the world at large, but he also contributed to all these very, very different areas and domains of psychology with very different kinds of methodologies, very different kinds of, uh, very different kinds of work, very different kinds of theories. Um, and he contributed to all of them and contrib contributed to all of them really early before they had even appeared in the rest of psychology. Um, but the thing that I think is perhaps uh, most striking about Henry, and you can see this in the third book in the, in the trilogy, um, is that Henry has also always been interested not just in describing things and saying this is theory of mind and this is how theory of mind develops, but in explaining things. And he's been interested in explanations in both ways. He's interested in explanations for children. And 
I think one of the real contributions he made was to show that even very young children already were providing and asking for explanations in systematic ways, something that most of us didn't think was going to be true. Um, I, again, I think it was Jackie who was mentioning, you know, after you've tested a bunch of three-year-olds and you say, why, and they say, it's Friday, <laughs> and uh, it's my birthday next week, and I think there might be a pony, and, you know, you get these beautiful stream of consciousness poems about Ponies and, uh, 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 ponies and birthdays, uh, but not anything that looks like an explanation. But Henry showed that if you just looked carefully enough and asked them in the right way, children were providing explanations. But equally, Henry was providing explanations, which is maybe part of why he could identify that with children. So this book, Making in Minds, is about not just what develops, but how and why it develops. Uh, and to go back to, uh, to go back to my own history with Henry. So we, after our awkward first meeting at SRCD and then the better one at, in 1986, the time when we really met was when Henry came to the Center for Advanced Studies in 1990 um, on a fellowship. And that, and he came and did a seminar with John Flavel that was about this weird thing that was just starting about theory of mind. And I had just started as a faculty member at Berkeley then and we went back and forth between Berkeley and Stanford. I remember Virginia Slaughter, who of course you probably know is also a distinguished developmental psychologist, um, was my first graduate student and came from, the, uh, came from the South and she drove us back and forth because she, her driving technique had obviously been learned by going to a lot of race car events, a lot of NASCAR events in, in Virginia. Um, so she would get us, you know, from Berkeley to Stanford and back again in 30 minutes, even if we were a bit shaken when we actually arrived. Um, and that was when Henry and I really started to work together. Um, and again, that was one of the great intellectual events in my life, that seminar. Um, that seminar was when we first started trying to articulate ideas about exactly what it meant for a theory of mind to be a theory. Um, and we spent hours and hours and hours walking through the Stanford campus talking. Um, and that actually started a series of conversations that have gone on to this day. I realized also when I was thinking about coming here that I'm maybe the only person, except maybe Paul, who never was actually in the same place as Henry. Everybody else who's talked actually spent time with Henry. And we never were really in the same place. We, we weren't in the same university. But we sort of established one of those nice you know, 17th century uh, universities of letters, um, whenever we would be at a conference, we would take off and go for long walks and talk, always the absolute height of the conferences, almost made going to SRCD worthwhile, almost. <laughs> um, uh, and we did that in all the different places around the world. One of the ones that I remember getting back to the cross-cultural piece was this very rainy day in Beijing, um, this beautiful, pouring rain where the pouring rain didn't really seem to matter because Beijing was so marvelous and the conversation was, uh, the conversation was so great. Um, but lots of other conversations like that and then long, long, long letters um, and lots of them that carried on the conversations even more. Um, uh, and that was when we developed the ideas that became the ideas in uh, the child's theory of mind really as a theory, a paper that we did uh, a couple of times in different versions. Um, so that was really the idea of the theory, the idea of the theory theory. Um, but I think it's important to say this is all the elders talking about the past, but it's not like Henry is just living in the past. In fact, most recently, and I, I think Kim Brink is still here, he's continued to think about theory of mind in ways that are right there at the cutting edge of the future. So this has been this whole research project uh, thinking about uh, what children understand about the minds of robots. What do they understand about the minds of computers? What will they think when they're out there in the world thinking about robots? And just as in his earlier work, Henry's shown that children understand the minds of robots in some ways, in ways that are like adults, but in other ways that are very unlike the ways that we typically think as adults. And I think this is a great frontier of uh, the kind of thinking that we're going to be that we're going to be doing in the future. Um, 
OK, so that's all about Henry's science. And I decided, the hell with my science. We should be talking about Henry's science instead. But I did want to talk a little bit about Henry also as a mentor and a role model, which it turns out is also a bit redundant because so many people have talked about this already. Um, and as you probably know, Henry is, I think, one of the few people to get both the APS and APA mentor awards. And I know that for Henry, those are the most significant awards that he's gotten. Those are the ones that are the most meaningful to him. Um, and I don't have, it turns out I don't, because I'm not a picture guy. I don't actually have pictures of me and Henry, or pictures of Henry. But as someone who likes metaphors, I've always thought of Henry as being essentially Jimmy Stewart. Um, uh, those could even be those yellow legal pads, actually. Um, uh, why do I think of Henry as being Jimmy Stewart? Uh, Jimmy Stewart's kind of an interesting character in movies, right? Because he is a movie star, but he's good. And, you know, usually as, I guess, you know, I'm not sure if Milton actually said this, but someone said this about Milton, that usually the bad guys get all the good lines, right? And usually it's the bad guys who are the ones who are compelling and interesting. And it's hard to think of an example of someone who's really a good guy and is a movie star too. And that's Jimmy Stewart, of course, and that's Henry. And some of that Jimmy Stewart, you know, kind of charming, all shucks, Midwestern um, uh, self-deprecation that goes with really being a movie star at the same time, right? That's the combination that you see in Henry. And that's connected to uh, something else that I learned in that 1990 uh, seminar. So as I said, it was incredibly exciting, wonderful intellectual work. And I would come back from that seminar, and I would be totally exhausted. That was partly Virginia's driving. But, but a lot of it was just I, I was trying to figure out, why am I so exhausted? I have these terrible splitting headaches and just be totally, totally worn out by the time I got, by the time I got home to Berkeley. And I realized that it was because I had been a product of MIT Cognitive Science and Oxford Philosophy. Those had been my two great intellectual influences. And what that meant was that actually being in a room with a bunch of people who were kind and nice <laughs> and took into account the views of people who disagreed with them, something else that somebody uh, mentioned, and considered alternatives to their views and sought out evidence that would falsify their hypotheses, and that was exhausting. That was just the amount of executive control and inhibition that that, um, that, that required was just so great that I was worn out by the time uh, the, that required, especially from someone who'd been trained in Oxford philosophy, was so great that I would just be exhausted by the time I got home. But obviously, this was an incredibly salutary, uh, that was an incre this was an incredibly salutary lesson at the same time. Um, and having Henry and also John Flavel, who himself was a role model for Henry as a, a mentor and a role model and someone who was not just talking about the content, but also uh, conveying the sense of what the activity of science was all about. In some ways, that was a more important lesson for me from that 1990 seminar than even the content of the theory of mind really being a theory. Um, and I think that's something that Henry has done for other uh, and as people here have said, has served as that kind of mentor and role model for the field as a whole, not just for his own students, but for people in the uh, people in the world and people in science. And I think there's a particular kind. You know, it's easy to say that somebody's, as in the Jimmy Stewart case, that somebody's good or virtuous, but there's a particular kind of virtue that comes for, with science. So there's a particular set of temptations and virtues that are particularly ones about science. And those are things like sort of having the integrity to say, oh, I was wrong about this. Or as, um, as uh, Marjorie was saying, having the persistence to say, OK, this is the right study. This is going to be really hard and take two years of hard work. But if it's the right study, then that's the right study. Caring more about what's true in the world than your own ego or what your own how your uh, going, how your status in the field is going to be determined by what you discover. 
And those virtues are the ones that I think Henry has more than anybody that I know, more than any other scientist that I know. Um, so I guess my last uh, comment, and then we can hear from Henry and I'll go and get dinner. Uh, my last piece of advice is if for all those people, young faculty members in the audience who are graduate students and postdocs, the way that I was now <laughs> 40 years ago, um, be like Henry. And all in there. Thank you, Allison. I, I love this comparison, that's so apt, it's wonderful. Um, and so now we're so privileged that we get to hear from Henry. Um, and thank you all. Uh, on, uh, since Henry will have the last words, um, I will just say thank you all so much for being here today. It's been such a special day for, for all of us and um, means so much, so thank you. Okay, does that work? Okay. Um, I do have some things to say, but I wanted to start out by saying, um, at a, at a other occasion, sort of like this, I don't even remember which one it was, but um, I was talking about it, and my son Daniel said, sheesh, they're all your friends. <laughs> <laughs> I can't take all of this fully. Um, so it's clear, from, to me at least, and I imagine to you too, everything that's said today that I've been very blessed. And uh, in fact, the title for today's festivity, I like Susan's one, but it could be A Fortunate Life. Uh, my fortune and blessings have included great colleagues, collaborators, um, who are also cherished friends. You've heard several of them. They also include great students who are now colleagues and collaborators and cherished friends. Um, and I've been blessed with a great career, too. Um, a vocation full of uh, teaching and research that I'm actually quite proud of, but only possible because of great collaborators and colleagues and students who have been my great fortune to work with over the years. Um, thank you, and to the many of you who are here today, thank you in particular. It's so neat of you to come and to see you. And uh, for those who are not, I'm looking forward to seeing them again and as soon as possible. So now on that point, I want to mention two, just briefly, who I won't be able to see because they passed away this past year. And one is Candy Peterson. She's my great friend and colleague in Australia, and she's the woman that I did all the work with deaf kids with. Um, and the other is David Liu, who you heard about several times, a former student and terrific colleague, many of you. I knew him too, and uh, we're fortunate enough to know him, and he passed away this past year. So I've been blessed with a wonderful family too, beginning with my wife of 49 years, Karen Lind. And, Karen. and she has backstopped everything that you've heard today, right? and more. Uh, sometimes, alas, it cost us some of our own aspirations, but always in my court, so thank you, Karen. And Karen and I have two children, two other blessings, two sons, Ned and Daniel. Okay. And through them, we've gotten two wonderful daughters, their wives, Karen and Chelsea. Um, and not only that, but 
three wonderful grandkids. <laughs> Wave your hands, guys. Chase, AJ, Emma. Anyway, right there. Um, they're just hoping I'll quit and we can go to dinner. <laughs> um, everything, well, it's, it's fitting to mention these children. Uh, because one of the greatest blessings of my life was discovering the world of childhood. Um, it was just good luck and good fortune. Because uh, you heard briefly today, but before I went to graduate school, I was a kindergarten and a preschool teacher. And that was essentially just to get out of the draft. Um, and this may very well never have happened. Called it 40, 70 years ago when I was growing up. Um, and in a, in a southern world, perhaps in particular, um, it was a world where children were the province of women, um, not men. And kindergartners and preschools were the province of women, too, not men. Um, with only a few exceptions, like Steve Sternberg, who is here. Steve Sternberg and I, at the University of uh, Minnesota, we, we taught preschoolers together. Um, but so for me, being able to fall into the world of childhood was just uh, an extraordinarily different thing. Um, and then to go on to be able to make a career just hanging around with children? Well, nothing wrong with that, right? So, so the German novelist, Frederick Buechner, wrote, you find your vocation at the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep need. And humanity is founded on children, of course, and they are deeply in need of love, Discovery, safety, and nurture. And I found my deep gladness in their company, in their wisdom, their smiles, um, in their ideas that in the right circumstances, they'll just freely give you and share with you. So not everyone gets to find their vocation, but I did. And it's been a fortunate life, indeed. Thank you. Thank you to you all. It's such, a, it's such a blessing for me to have so many of you come. It's really great. It's really great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to Susan for organizing it all.